Good afternoon. I'm Council Member I. Denise Miller. I'm the Chair of Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon to this important hearing. Today's hearing, uh, for today's hearing, we'll be hearing four pieces of legislation, intro 633, 752, 755, and intro 756. I would like to discuss intro 633 within this opening statement and my esteemed colleagues, uh, Council Member Eugene, Chair of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, will be discussing the other bills. Uh, and we'll be hearing from the bills, certainly um, from the bill sponsors, Council Member Lori Cumbo and the public advocate. This bill would mandate all city agencies to provide pay employment equity data to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, otherwise known as DCAS. This data would then be put to, together in an annual report that includes a variety of employee-related data, the gender and racial groups of such employees, if available. This data then would be provided to the mayor and the speaker in an annual report, along with recommendations to address such problems associated with pay and employment inequities. On April 27, for 2017, this committee held a hearing on the same bill. We received information from the public advocate and held a roundtable in 2017 with an organizations dedicated to advocating for women's rights in the workforce, with many experts in attendance saying that it was extremely difficult to prove wage disparities because there was little data to point to. This, among other things, is an impetus for this bill, which will allow us to have a better understanding of what city employees are getting paid and what is actually happening in terms of the wage gap and gender gap and discrimination and employment. This hearing today will further strengthen the reasons why we need this bill and allow for pay disparities to be reduced while making New York City a more equitable and just place to work, serving as a model for private sector. What exactly is pay equity? Pay equity means that the criteria employees, employers use to set wages be sex and race neutral. When this does not happen and we have disparities, this is called wage gap. It is a very frustrating aspect of our economy that a wage gap between men and women still exists. According to the Institute for Women Policy Research, the earliest available national data from 1980 for the medium usual weekly earnings in 2017 dollars shows that women made just 64.2% of what a man earned, while the most recent census data from 2016 indicates that this figure has risen to 80.5 of males earnings. In 36 years, this gap has improved only 18%. This is simply not enough. Here within New York City, we are not immune for the 2016 in New York City, New York City government. For in 2016, New York City, the overall wage gap, <clears throat> which compared with the medium annual earnings of men and women working full time was 85%. For black women, the gap was 53%. For Latino women, 74%, 44%. And for Asian women, 74%, 76% for white women as comparing medium annual earnings to those white men. This disparity needs to be addressed in a more sufficient and substantive way. And it is the, our hope that intro 633 can help be a solution to this problem as it relates to city government workforce. Let us set an example for other municipalities across the state and the country and private sector as to how we treat our workers. I look forward to the hearing hearing from those who will testify today in understanding how this wage gap has changed since our last hearing, as well as what can be done to better reduce these striking inequities. I would like to acknowledge the members of the committee who are with us today. This uh, council, we have council member uh, Cumbo, who of course is the bill sponsor, council member Ben Kalos, council member Somebody else on that. Somebody else is on that side. Yeah. Perkins from the great village of Harlem. Uh, and uh, certainly um, the council staff and chief counsel uh, uh, Malcolm 
Kevin is around here somewhere, Kendall, and of course, uh, my senior advisor, Joe Goldblum, and Mr. Brandon Clark. And now we will hear from my uh, esteemed colleague from Brooklyn for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. I would like to thank my colleague, my esteemed colleague, Chair Miller of the Civil Service and Labor Committee for making this joint hearing possible. In addition to the uh, entry of 633, the Civil and Human Rights Committee will be hearing introductory bills number 752, creating an office of diversity and inclusion within the Department of Citywide Administrative Services introduced by my colleague, by my colleague, Council Member Lori Combo, and two bills that I'm proud to have introduced Introductory Bill 755, requiring the Equal Employment Practices Commission to analyze and report annually on citywide racial and ethnic classification on their utilization and adverse impact. An introductory bill number 756, requiring the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to review and report annually on the city effort to collect racial and ethnic demographic information, including the review of racial classification categories and employee response rate. As one of the most diverse cities in the country, and as one of the city's biggest employers, it is vital that the city's civil service reflect the people that it serves. As the most recent data available makes clear, Currently, there are certain groups whose participation in the city's workforce remains low. The Hispanic workforce, for example, sits around 20%, even though this group makes up to 28% of the employed population. Similarly, Asian civil servants comprise only 9% of the city's workforce and 15% of the world labor force. Part of the aim of today's hearing is to shed light on how the city can improve on these uh, numbers and ensure that its uh, workforce is representative of the workforce as a well. whole. According to U.S. Census Bureau, historically, one would would to upward social mobility has been on private and local government. The committee is therefore very interested in to hear whether the current initiative being used by the city agencies to recruit and retain a, a diverse workforce have been successful. City laws and policies required agencies to draft specific procedures that follow equal on private opportunities guidelines, but there is concern that these processes are vague and do not identify our agencies are not compliant. Make it diffi difficult to remedy. To improve the current process, until 752 <coughs> would establish an office of diversity and inclusion within the Department of City-wide administration services. The office would be responsible for creating specific directives, policies, procedures, and measurable goals that endeavor the, to diversify the city's workforce. The city's procedures of collective, of collective equal and primary opportunity data is an essential component in evaluating the city's workforce diversity goal. The city currently collects and collects some information that provides a snapshot of the racial and gender makeup of the civil service. But these statistics do not offer a complete picture. For example, while the annual workforce report produced by DCAS provides uh, comparative data on the racial and gender composition of the city's workforce for new hires, 
separation, retirement, and resignation, there are no gender or racial uh, breakdown of salary brackets, promotions, or level of seniority, all of which would be clear indicators to measure upward mobility. In contrast, the city of Philadelphia, which also publishes a workforce report, provides the gender and racial composition of categories such as executive level, those are making over 90,000 per year, commissioners and directors, including the head of the department, and the report also provides a section specifically looking at salary disparities within the different groups. Ensuring that the data, the data collected by the administration is clear and accessible is vital. And that is why I have introduced Intro 755 and Intro 756. Intro 755 2018 reflects the Council concern that there is an underutilization of various groups within the city agencies. As I have stated, the current way to reporting diversity data make it difficult to track the progress of different groups an essential compo component in evaluating the effectiveness of Equal Employment Opportunity Initiative. In 755-2018, Intro 755-2018 would therefore require the Equal, Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Practices Commission, EEPC, which is an independent non-mayoral city entity to report annually on whether agencies are meeting the equal employment opportunities goal, and when they are not, the EEPC would be required to specifically identify and provide corrective uh, recommendation to address underutilization. Currently, many of the recommendations are standardized and do not paint a specific picture of our city agencies are not compliant. The Council would like greater detail an EEPC's report, thereby enabling a clear way of monitoring trend. The committee is also concerned that the current diversity categories are broad and do not necessarily reflect the group that people identify with. There are over 800 different languages spoken in New York City, and yet the current racial classification used by DCAS are limited to five. The two genders categories are also not reflective of the different groups that people identify with. Currently, Arab Americans are classified as white despite facing national security uh, scrutiny, hate crime, and various forms of discrimination. About four years ago, the US Census Bureau had agreed to add two new categories, one for residents of Middle Eastern and North African origin, and one for those of Hispanic origin. But in January, the Bureau abruptly announced it would not move forward with the reforms. This continued a ratio of several groups is not in line with the city's approach toward diversity, and we ought to lead by example and recognizing all groups. Intro 756 would therefore require the Department of Citywide Administration Services to review its racial classification categories, which are currently fairly limited. This bill would also require DCAS to annually report on the city's effort to collect diversity data and the response rate of employees. We look forward today to hear from the administration, the EEPC, and advocate to learn more about their recommendation regarding Intro 752 2018, 755 2018, and 756 2018. Before uh, we begin, I would like to acknowledge the numbers, uh, even that uh, my colleagues and Mr. Chair did it uh, before, but I'm going to do it again. I'm going to acknowledge the, the, the the members who have joined us. We have Council Member 
Mezel is here. Council member uh, Lender, who is a member of the committee. Council member Perkins, Council member Rosenthal, member of the committee also. Council member Lloyd Campbell. And uh, Council member also Kelos. Council member Adams. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And now I would uh, like to ask uh, the committee council to administer the oath. Be, 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 before we, uh, I'm uh, I'm let sorry. me turn it over to my co-chair, Councilman Van Miller. You can hold, keep your hand Thank up you. like that. Just hold it. We'll get back to you in a minute. Don't. <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. Um, before we begin uh, testimony, hearing testimony, I'd like to hear from uh, the sponsor of uh, 633, Councilmember Lori Combo. Thank you, Chair Miller. Thank you, Chair Eugene, uh, for this very important hearing today. Good afternoon. I am Lori Cumbo, your Majority Leader of the New York City Council, and I want to thank both of my chairs, Matthew Eugene and Councilmember Danique Miller, for presenting this powerful hearing today, and we are certainly going to make her story today. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tireless advocacy on the subject matter of pay equity wage transparency, and employment diversity that took place both inside this council and with great support from Councilmember Danique Miller. And from the countless advocates here, such as Beverly Newfill, the founder and president of Pow Her New York, and she has been so dynamic on the steps of City Hall every year, all the time, rain, sleet, or hail, to push this effort forward. And we thank you for your advocacy. President Emeritus, author Chiliotis, who has been a phenomenal leader um, since he has retired, and before that, you would never know the difference that there had been a retirement that took place because this issue is so close and dear to his heart that he is going to continue to work on this issue. And I also want to acknowledge the newly appointed president, Gloria Middleton of CWA Local 1180 and all of the dynamic men and women who are here in red coats and without for your fierce and tireless advocacy, whether it's on the steps of City Hall, in front of new news cameras, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, you all have championed this issue and it is going to benefit all people throughout this nation. You have worked so hard and I have been so excited to bring intro 633 legislation that reports on pay and employment equity data. What we've seen a lot is this topic of pay equity but we've also seen it in the entertainment world. Many of you know the the very famous movie the 1996 Jerry Maguire film where Cuba Gooding roars show me the money. And we have also Rihanna, one of my favorites, that says, pay me what you owe me. And that's what this hearing is about. But when I was a child, about eight years old, almost uh, in 19, 1983, I believe, she came out with this song. When I grew up, eight years old, Dolly Parton would be on the radio singing this song. And I knew the lyrics a little bit, but I really know them now. She stated, Working nine to five, what a way to make a living. Barely getting by, it's all taken and no given. They just use your mind and they never give you credit. It's enough to drive you crazy if you let it. You would think that I deserve a fat promotion, want to move ahead, but the boss won't seem to let me. I swear sometimes that man is out to get me. Now, if you think about these lyrics, almost 40 years ago, Women particularly have been feeling this frustration all throughout. And today is a time that we are going to move forward from the era of the Dolly Parton songs, and we're gonna to start to get our money, as Cuba Gooding has said. The wage gap persists regardless of industry, and the reasons for this gap are multifaceted. The wage gap is persistent within all occupations and regardless of educational level. Discrimination and bias still contribute to the wage gap. Research highlights that discrimination and unconscious bias continue to affect women's wages around 38%, whereas 62% of the wage gap can be attributed to occupational and industry differences. Differences in experience and education and factors such as race, region, and unionization. Debt Poverty and homelessness are the realities faced by women living paycheck to paycheck, unable to meet the inflated cost of living in this city. 
Women represent half of our city's population and workforce, and yet we have been shortchanged by the very economic system that would not flourish without our contributions. Women can no longer afford to be nickel and dime when we earn $5.8 billion less than our male counterparts annually. $5.8 billion. We know the statistics. White women earn 84 percent for every dollar earned by men. For women of color, every penny counts as Hispanic, black, and Asian women earn only 46 cents, 55 cents, and 63 cents respectively. The numbers just don't add up. Our city's economy is stronger because of our growing and diverse workforce. Look at this council. We are the most dynamic body because of the diversity that exists here. But I will be, if I were to receive less pay than any of my male counterparts, I'll say that. <laughs> equal opportunity must also translate to equal pay for equal work. Though women have outpaced men in education, earning more advanced degrees, many have been benchmarks in their career advancement as a result of salary history. I am proud to have worked with public advocate Letitia James and co-sponsored the salary history ban legislation one step in the journey of a million to get us to where we need to be. This legislation will end discriminatory hiring practices that disproportionately affect women and ensure a fair compensation based on experience for 3.8 million workers in the public and private sectors. Moving forward, more must be done to increase transparency when it comes to the reporting of pay and employment data within city agencies. For the first time, we will have access to data that will clearly show the discriminatory pattern of wage suppression and subjective promotions based on sex, gender, and race. But there's further and more work that needs to be done. These issues are not just faced by women of color, but rather faced by a diversity of people, cultural differences, and racial minorities, immigrants, as well as the disabled and the LGBTQ communities. This legislation is going to lift up all people, but it is through the inspiration and the hard work of women that this advancement will happen. The people of New York deserve a transparent process when it comes to pay equity, and we will continue to organize and raise our voices until our city pays them what they're worth. In the final line of that song by Dolly Parton, she says, there's a better life and you dream about it, don't you? Today's the day to end the dream we have to begin to live the reality. And like many of you, we were present for Mayor Bill de Blasio's state of the city. And in the state of the city, he documented and said that we want New York City to be the fairest big city in America. And I can think of no legislation better than this legislation that's in alignment with that state of the city address. And we must continue to work and to hold our administration accountable to making sure that women in particular and people of all races and nationalities and sexual orientations and religions are given their fair opportunity to be their best selves. And the only way to do that is through having an equitable government. Thank you. No, listen, listen. But. I know it's going to be a lot of this, but this is what we do, okay? Thank you. I, I'll give you one myself. <laughs> so um, with that one being said, I, I, I want to take a point of privilege and acknowledge once again our Chair of Women's uh, Issues Committee from the Great Borough of Manhattan. Okay. Testimony for them. Uh, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will now administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. If you could raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Good afternoon, Chair Miller, Chair Eugene, and members of the city council committees on civil service and labor and civil and human rights. I am Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, known as DCAS. I'm joined today by Sanford Cohen, our Deputy General Counsel. I'm pleased to be here today to inform you of DCAS's commitment to improving fairness and equity across the city and to testify about intros 752, 755, 756, and 633. In October of 1987, the city's Department of Personnel, now known as DCAS, established the Bureau of Citywide Equal Employment Opportunity. 
In 2012, reflecting an expansion of its mission, this bureau became known as the Office of Citywide Diversity and Equal Employment Opportunity, also known as Citywide Diversity and EEO, within DCAS. To broaden the reach of the Citywide Office of Diversity and EEO, in March of 2018, DCAS merged this office within the Human Capital Line of Service, renaming it to the Office of Citywide the Office of Citywide Equity and Inclusion, known as CEI. This merger will improve service delivery, increase compliance with EEO and civil service policies, and increase access to employment and promotion opportunities. Our primary mission is to ensure that the city's equal employment opportunity, EEO policy, and EEO-related responsibilities under the New York City Charter are followed both in letter and spirit. CEI provides guidance to agencies agencies on EEO policy and procedure, applicable law changes, and other EEO-related issues. Toward that end, in addition to providing EEO officers across the city basic training, CEI hosts monthly best practices meetings to share information and to discuss such topics as proposed legislation, complaint trends, diversity and inclusion best practices and trends, upcoming training programs, and EEO compliance. Through DCAS's EEO and Diversity website, CEI provides agencies with 24-hour access to standardized procedures, templates, and other resources. To implement city charter mandates, the EEO policy requires agencies to develop annual diversity and EEO plans that address recruitment, selection, promotion, complaint handling, training, and activities to prevent employment di discrimination. Agencies develop the plans under the guidance of CEI, and they are subject to CEI's review and approval. Agency progress implementing the annual plan is captured in quarterly reports submitted to DCAS, the mayor, and the council. Agency heads are also required to issue an annual EEO and diversity statement to memorialize their commitment to equitable, fair, and inclusive employment and recruitment practices. Inclusive recruitment and outreach are key to promoting equal employment opportunity. To increase access to municipal employment opportunities, DCAS established the Office of Citywide Recruitment, OCR, in 2015. The office seeks to generate a pipeline for applicants with the education and experience needed to sustain operations across the city workforce. OCR shares information with historically underserved communities, such as veterans, people with disabilities, the unemployed, and the LGBTQ community in order to foster greater diversity. Using workforce data, OCR re reviews gender distribution, ethnic composition, and attrition rates of the workforce to focus its recruitment efforts. Since its establishment, OCR has participated in 360 job fairs and conducted 300 Civil Service 101 sessions, a training program developed by the OCR team to simplify the civil service process and highlight the benefits of working for the city. Through the job fairs and trainings, OCR has reached over 32,000 job seekers. I am proud that the recruitment team has either participated in a job fair or conducted training in all 51 councilmanic districts and have participated in 14 events sponsored by the council. These efforts have been complemented by other diversity events supported by the de Blasio administration, including the city's first nationwide diversity and inclusion colloquium in October 2016, which drew 150 participants from 67 agencies across 12 municipalities a citywide job fair in November 2016, the city's first diversity job fair held in partnership with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities in November of 2017, the city's first symposium for HR and EEO professionals, which focused on disability etiquette and the 55A program in April of 2018. We've also engaged CUNY as a partner to increase the diversity of the city's entry-level pipeline. We are looking forward to working with the Council on Intro 752 on ways in which to build upon the important work performed by this office. We do have concerns about the proposed mandate to set and enforce numerical benchmarks to achieve representation in the workforce proportionate to the characteristics of city residents. The mandate must take into account both the civil service law, which requires appointment pursuant to competitive examination for approximately 90% of the city's workforce, and the requirements imposed by the United States Constitution and federal anti-discrimination statutes for implementing race and gender-based employment practices. Workforce demographic data is maintained in the citywide Equal Employment Database System, known as SEEDS. 
SEEDS collects demographic information during the application, onboarding, and employee background investigation processes. These data points are used in compliance reports, the annual workforce profile report, and in ad hoc reports. SEEDS data is used to prepare federally mandated biannual EEO4 reports, which profile the workforce by gender and ethnicity, salary ranges, job category, and agency function. The city's latest report submitted in 2017 shows, among other things, that the share of minority and women officials and administrators increased from approximately 45% in 2007 to 55% in 2017. The next report is due in 2019. DCAS also provides agencies with quarterly charter-mandated reports that focus on characteristics of the workforce by agency, including job group, civil service title, race, ethnicity, and gender, civil service status, pay class, full-time or part-time, new hires, promotions, separations, and utilization, which compares the representation of the incumbent workforce to the available workforce in the labor market, helping to identify overutilization or overrepresentation and underutilization or underrepresentation of demographic groups within agencies and job groups. In 2015, CEI implemented quarterly interactive workforce diversity dashboards for agencies. The dashboard summarizes the data found in the quarterly charter mandated reports in an interactive graphic format that makes it easier to communicate key indicators to agency and management leadership. With the various reports produced by the office, we are confident that we can work with the council to ensure that the information required in intro 755 can improve and build upon our existing work. CEI develops and delivers standardized EEO, diversity, and inclusion training. These courses are consistent with best practices and guidance provided by civil rights enforcement agencies, like the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, New York State Division of Human Rights, and the New York City Commission on Human Rights. EEO, diversity, and inclusion trainings are offered year-round and are accessible to all city employees. CEI provides EEO and diversity training to agency EEO and diversity professionals citywide. It provides new EEO officers an introductory training within two weeks of being onboarded. It holds a five-day boot camp training for EEO officers twice a year. We, are also, we also offer more specialized trainings in the following areas, mentoring, religion in the workplace, micro triggers, LGBTQ inclusion, understanding unconscious bias, disability etiquette, structured interviewing, and Everybody Matters, which serves as the city's foundational diversity and inclusion training. We are pleased that intros 752, 755, and 756 complement so much of the existing work performed by the Office of Citywide Equity and Inclusion. I look forward to collaboration with the council. Now that we've discussed in detail the important work that CEI does, I would like to briefly highlight our efforts to ensure fair and equitable compensation across the city. As you are aware, DCAS is also responsible for administering the city's civil service system. For all competitive titles, hiring and promotions are based on merit and fitness as determined by competitive examination. And many of our titles come with predetermined salaries based on collective bargaining agreements. In certain situations, however, there may be discretion to set a salary within a prescribed salary band. Managers and original jurisdiction employees, approximately 7% of the city's workforce, fall within this category. To establish a level playing field for employees serving in titles with limited discretion with respect to salary, Mayor de Blasio issued Executive Order 21 in 2016. This order removes the reliance on pay history and the calculation of salary offers to applicants and prohibits hiring managers from inquiring about a candidate's salary history before making a conditional offer of employment. As a result of Executive Order 21, city agencies must assign value to a position based on education, experience, and level of technical expertise, rather than a candidate's previous salary history. Achieving pay equity is an extremely important concern shared by the council and this administration. We support the spirit of Intro 633 to increase the availability of data concerning how the city pays its employees in various job categories by race, ethnicity, and gender groups, consistent with the privacy concerns of employees who voluntarily provide demographic information based on the city's commitment that an individual's information will be held in strict confidence. We are mindful that disclosure of demographic information at the individual level threatens to degrade the accuracy of the data. 
DCAS has and will continue to work in collaboration with the council to refine bills where appropriate. Our previous response to intro 633, formerly intro 1536, is evidence of our willingness to find a balance between increased transparency, protecting the privacy of our employees, and avoiding the degradation of the data we collect. I thank you for the opportunity to highlight the work performed by DCAS's citywide equity and inclusion team with respect to EEO, equity, and inclusion. We look forward to the council's continued partnership and will gladly answer any questions. Thank you. That was a mouthful, but we now see if we can drill down on all of that. And uh, I know you certainly come prepared as you have in the past to be able to address these very pertinent and relevant issues that we have before us. Um, and, and, and so uh, let's just begin with what you, uh, the latter part of your testimony, which was salaries, because uh, we know that salaries can vary widely across multiple agencies, which could also lead to pay inequities with men and women and, and folks of color and, and, and others. Uh, for example, using the uh, civil service title of agency attorney, one can find <coughs> uh, an experience opening in the NYPD salary ranging from 73,009 to 101,000, <coughs> and another experience uh, opening in DYCD uh, proposed for 58,000 to 89,000, and so on amongst <coughs> varying agencies. While we understand different city agencies are engaged in different types of work, a review of job description for both show an extensive li li list of legal services for all candidates in, to, in, to some degree. Um, how, how are the salary ranges determined for what, in such a title, as the title appears in the position either within the same agency or across uh, agencies throughout the city? Um, in the particular case that you mentioned, agency attorney, um, this particular title um, does fall within that group that is represented um, by a union and covered under a CBA. This title in particular also has various levels that have been negotiated. Each level has a prescribed salary band. Um, um, and, and based on the salaries that you mentioned, I believe um, at DYCD, that particular band falls within the assignment one of the agency attorney title, and the NYPD role is at the level of assignment level three. And so um, essentially with those negotiated um, assignment levels, the expectation is that someone serving at a higher level within that particular title is then assigned potentially um, a more complex caseload, potentially has a greater span of control. Um, in addition, when you look across agencies, sometimes, sometimes the salary band that is reported is also tied to the budget of that agency. So you may sometimes see a more narrow salary band that is posted because um, an agency potentially does not have the budget to um, support a higher paying position at the time. So, um the difference between the levels, is that a open, is that a promotional, or is that the discretion of agency managers and heads? Well, the establishment of those assignment levels and the bands are first negotiated. However, someone's progression through those assignment levels, that is a case where there is um, limit, limited um, discretion, meaning that an agency would use certain factors such as um, knowledge obtained over time, potentially time and title, performance evaluations to determine how someone would move up, um, w up those levels within that particular title. Um, so <clears throat> as we, so this is more or less a policy, what are the checks and balances on that? to make sure that one is that those agency heads are adhering to the criteria and that they're just not advancing their friend? Um, in terms of checks and balances, I, I'm not really sure. Um, so I'm this not can really go a lot question. of ways. And we, so because we're at the very beginning of this, <clears throat> your testimony and, and uh, this questioning period, so I'm, I'm sure we're going to drill further into it, mm -hmm. but at this point, we, we want to know that if, in fact, 
um, we have such broad salary ranges and, and your definition and justification for each salary range, there, there were several justifications for, for so. How do we in fact know that those justifications and those criteria are being adhered to? Well, DCAS, as you know, we set policy um, related to a host of um, employment practices, um, including EEO and certain HR practices as well. Um, the job with respect to compliance and adherence to those policies, is it lies with the agency head um, at the respective agencies. The city of New York has a decentralized hiring process. Um, that being said, um, we do use one system of record um, as it relates to all personnel transactions, and that's the New York City Automated Personnel System, known as DCAS. So within that system, we would actually see um, the rate that someone um, is originally um, hired into. And so um, in terms of checks and balances, we then ensure that individuals are not hired above the prescribed and negotiated salary range. So we have uh, a criteria for a particular title. Now we know that that title, um, that criteria, the, the criteria is the same. Um, more work may be demanded or more uh, technical work may be demanded from that title depending on what the agency is, right? Upon uh, uh, elevation of an individual within the title or salary, what has to be described? Is there anything uh, in place that <clears throat> is required for the agency heads to justify elevating the individual? Um, if you're referring to a specific policy that speaks to someone's um, advancement through assignment levels, um, no, that is not um, a policy that's written. However, there are certain guidance and best practices that, as a city that um, human capital does share with HR departments across the city. That being looking at time served in title, if there are particular trainings and skills that that person has obtained over time. So we certainly work with agencies to ensure that those best practices are carried forward. Separate and apart from that, there is a vetting. Um, for every title that we have within the city, currently we're at over 800 titles um, within our portfolio. And for every title, there are minimum qualifications. So also as part of that vetting process before someone's hired into a role that they meet those minimum quali qualification requirements as well. So is there a centralized uh, database where we could find this information? Could I go online and see why council member was promoted? No. Online? There is no. currently no database that would provide you with that information. Okay, because if it was a competitive exam, we'd, the scores would be uh, available, right? Would be right. Open to the in terms of a civil service exam, yes, there's information that we currently um, have that's available that would um, indicate your score on um, a civil service exam. Once again, as mentioned, 93% of the workforce serve within titles where there is essentially no discretion because those um, salaries are negotiated and covered under CBA. It's 7% um, where there is some discretion um, that could be exercised. So I know that, I, I know that council asked me to kind of, to, to, to ask this question, but it's so much here that we, and, and you guys hosted a, a inclusionary and diversity conference, uh, was it last year? Yes, we did. Uh, and and uh, addressing best practices nationally. Mm -hmm. What did you learn and what have you implemented? Um, we actually, well, the reason why we wanted to highlight the colloquium that took place was because really it was a first. Um, most of the conferences that HR and EEO professionals take part in really speak to the private sector, where there's a great deal of discretion as it relates to salary setting, hiring practices, et cetera. Within the city, as you know, New York City is a civil service municipality. So with that, there are some inherent restrictions on um, navigation through the civil service system. Um, that being said, one of the best practices that um, we learned um, and we were happy to see that it confirmed how we've operated was really a reliance on the data. Um, as you know, um, DCAS has worked really closely with the council to be not only collaborative but transparent. Um, um, the information we have on the open data portal, the EEO4 information we release, um, our workforce profile report um, with every iteration um, looking at different slices of data are definitely evidence of that. And so certainly that was the best practice that we need to continue with. Um, also, um, 
creating greater synergy between um, EEO professional, professionals and HR professionals was something that we certainly carried away um, because sometimes complaints related to salary setting, um, rate of pay, overlap between those two areas. And that was also one of the reasons why in this latest merge, we decided to merge our equity and inclusion office within human capital to ensure that that synergy existed for the city. Are there, are there some agencies that you find more compliant than others or some agencies that obviously, <coughs> excuse me, uh, lack the type of diversity that reflect the values of the city? Um, certainly, as you look across job categories, you may see um, differences in diversity. Um, we have some titles where the historical candidate pool is really homogenous, where you see um, more women historically applying for social services positions, um, um, and then um, as it relates to certain craft positions or skilled trades, you would see that the candidate pool was you know, primarily men. Um, and so you would see that diversity um, variance across city agencies. But in, in, in terms of uh, titles that, um, in terms of titles that have a particular criteria that have been met by all the candidates, but candidates end up in one agency and not another, do you see that? I, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. You're Can saying you the that the police department may pay a little more uh, than others in that particular title. In that particular in title. In that particular title. Yes. Um, but there are titles that do similar work across the city um, and are paid differently in different agencies. For um, example, DOT. There are laborers throughout the city, and DOT is probably the least, one of the least diverse. And, you know, interestingly enough, I spoke at their Black History uh, event in February, and, and I started by uh, saying that I bet I could identify what department in the agency that each person that was in the room worked in. And that's uh, been kind of the history of that agency. Um, but based on the data that you have, uh, based on the data that you have, could you identify um, certain agencies that, that are, are better and includes being in more inclusive than others? I, I wouldn't necessarily frame it as one agency being better or worse, because in this particular case of laborers, this is an area where as a city, you know, there are some additional improvements we need to make. Um, one of the focuses of our Office of Citywide Recruitment has been to look at skilled trade positions, labor positions, um, carpentry positions, because historically the candidate pool has had so few women. Right. And then in addition to taking a civil service exam where, you know, the beauty of it that it's based on merit and fitness and not um, gender or race, once again adds um, another um, restriction um, um, as it relates to um, those who are finally appointed into the positions. So what we do is we look at our workforce utilization report, as I mentioned in testimony, that really shows you where there's underutilization across job categories. We then work with agencies to enhance their recruitment efforts to ensure that at the time that an exam is administered, that you have a more diverse candidate pool that will eventually take and pass the exam. So I, I, I know that in terms of the human capital and, 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 and the competitive exams, right? But I, I would submit to you that there are three, probably closer to five variations of the labor title within the city of New York. Maybe two, maybe open competitive. The others aren't, and there's a, a, a serious pay disparity in those, and that is just one example. Um, but they're all city employees. And how, how, how do you aggregate this, this data? To, to kind of figure out, and that's essentially what this is about, right? Which is uh, whether or not people performing the same task or being compensated equitably. So there are a few factors that we look at. Um, we look at potentially time and title, education and experience. We look at the candidate pool, as I mentioned before. Um, we also um, look at the span of control, level of responsibility of that agency. Um, so once again, we, we don't look at one factor to determine um, whether disparity exists. We look at a host of factors. Um, additionally, there are times when, and use DOT as an example, um, because of a recent um, legal mandate, 
they have this need to hire in significant numbers for a few titles. Some agencies have come to us asking that we conduct some kind of analysis because they believe there may be poaching going on, meaning that one agency is looking to hire um, folks serving in the same title for more money. And so in those cases, we do provide agencies with analysis that shows current um, salaries of their incumbents, showing them the min, max, and average to see how closely aligned their salaries are for recruitment purposes. And how do you analyze this data? Do you, do you sit down with these agencies and, and analyze the data? We meet with agencies quite often. We do. Um, and we ask to review job descriptions. We ask to look at candidate slates. There are reports that we have that, um, especially for discretionary positions, where um, a collective bargaining agreement wouldn't um, dictate the rate of pay percent potentially, um, where we look at was there a diverse candidate pool? Did you have a diverse um, interview panel? Um, EEO officers at the agencies also review interview questions. Um, and we also provide structured interviewing um, classes and unconscious bias training, once again, um, to push forward our mission in terms of having a fair and equitable workplace. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. And certainly we have more questions. We have questions from the, my colleague, Council Member uh, Drum. Uh, council member, we've been joined by Council member Rodriguez and, and, and uh, you know, open with Council member Rodriguez. Good question. In the city of Two Tail, that we were able to get a major elected with a mandate to close the gap, reality is that we still have the city when it comes to diversity in leadership position. And this is more than one individual. I don't think that the city have ever had a mayor so committed to bring more black, Latino, and women to the workforce, especially to leadership than this mayor. However, we have inherited a structure that go like in two different direction. It's like Nemo, the movies, and Dory go in two different direction, and then they mix. Here we are progressive, nationwide, challenges one of the worst President Trump for lack of women and men of color in his cabinet. It is more easy to mobilize millions of my brothers and sisters who are progressive. But when the budget director came here and testified, and they take the whole area right side, all we see is faces of people that they don't reflect the diversity of our city. A city where women is a large majority, a city where 29% are black, Latinos, where 27% are black. We are the majority. So when you look through agency, it does, it's not reflected. So one of my questions is, when you look to the workforce, let's focus on leadership. How many leadership positions do we have in the city of New York through all the agency that DICA coordinate? Well, we have 41 mayoral agencies. So for each of those agencies, you would have one commissioner. Um, the number of um, other deputy commissioners or associate commissioners or assistant commissioners, that would have to be my takeaway. I don't have that information with me. Um, and it, it also depends on... Um, but, I'm sorry. Just focus on the number. So we don't know how many leadership positions do we have in the city of New York? I have that, but I don't necessarily have that at my fingertips. I can look to one of the members of my team to see if we can pull it very quickly for you. Do we agree that regardless the number is... There's a lack of black, Latino, and women in those leadership positions? I, I would say this. Because we, we know the percentage in senior New York City mm -hmm. population. Do we feel that the leadership position throughout the agencies reflect the New York City population when we look to the breakdown of white, black, and Latino in nation? 
it doesn't directly reflect it. However, it is improved when you do a 10 year look back. No, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. No, I give credit. Mm -hmm. I, I, I so can sir, tell you that, you know, to do. as Dominican, mm -hmm. I can tell you that when Dinkins was a mayor, he was good with us. He had Josh Acosta in a position, human rights. In this administration, we have Lise Camilo's in DICAS. We have Fenioski Peña Mora. I had no doubt. But you know, mayor will be over in four years. We don't know who the new mayor is going to be. So the importance of this legislation, that also I want to add my name, that is about being sure that we put the tool in place to be sure that, again, like, you know, we've been failing. And I'm not saying the last four years. I'm talking about we as a city. It, and it's not even, tell me, look at the Banking Commission in New York City. Tell me how many are black and Latino. The most powerful agency, the most powerful division in our city, still doesn't open the door to diversity. And I think, again, and it's coming from someone that sees this mayor as a partner, someone that has seen improvement. But you look at board throughout the city of New York, and I know that the mayor is committed. But, you know, as a former teacher from 13, for 13 years, when you go to TWIST, when you go to any agency, people have been there for 30 and 40 years. And it's difficult to share the privilege. It would take people the understanding to know New York City changed. In the 1900 census, the New York City population were, was 96% white, 2% black. Latino, we were not counted. In the 2017 population is the number that I share with you. So I think that this reporting effort that we want to put in place is about to take our city where we should be to be sure that in any agency, commissioners, directors, budget director, that should represent, we, need, we can be the model of our nation. And I hope that in the next four years, with the leadership of the mayor, with his commitment to continue opening more doors, we really work passing this bill, get decals in anything that we need to put in place, listening to CWA, and let's be sure that we pass this bill because this is needed, not just for us. It's also for our children. Thank you, council member. And uh, certainly, um, council member asked a good question about the leadership. Certainly, if the discretion of the elevation and these salaries is determined by such leadership, it's very important that the leadership reflect the masses. Um, we're gonna hear from council member Cumbo. Thank you, <clears throat> Chair Miller. Wanted to jump right into the heart of the matter. Do managers and supervisors employed by city agencies undergo unconscious bias training, which you've already addressed, but I wanted to get more specific into it, or what are the major challenges facing women and minorities in the city workforce today in terms of unequal pay distribution? So in your experience and what you're seeing, um, on the ground, what are the major challenges facing women and minorities that are present right now in current day? Um, I would say the primary challenges that we're seeing um, and we're actively trying to address really center around the fact that we see that um, a career trajectory for a woman is sometimes adversely impacted because um, of childcare or taking care of their families. And so um, with those um, positions over which we have limited discretion, um, the managers and original jurisdiction employees that I mentioned, um, we do have a paid parental leave program in place. And so we consistently um, market the program, make the services available to women and to men, so at the time that they um, need to take care of a child, that they have the opportunity to do so without worrying about um, where they stand professionally. Um, and additionally, um, I think that specifically in certain job categories, we've historically had a problem as a city with recruiting um, women and people of color um, in, in certain industries that have been um, predominantly um, uh, 
comprised of um, white men. We see that um, in our skilled trades. We see, see that in other um, types of um, positions. And so our Office of Citywide Recruitment has partnered with a host of CBOs as well as other agencies where there is underutilization in order to address um, those particular issues. Let me just uh, go back to your, your first response. So what you've noticed or what you've documented from all of the work that you've done is that the challenge that women are facing in terms of uh, promotion and or pay gap has much to do with uh, childcare issues and, and issues around um, family leave and those sorts of dynamics that are impeding a woman's uh, ability to make what their male counterparts make and or to get hired for uh, major promotions and that sort of thing. It definitely um, is a contributing factor, and that is not um, unlike what you see across the nation. And, and that was one of the reasons why parental leave for the city of New York was really so important for us to move forward with. Now, parental leave is great. I took advantage of it. My son is now eight months old. But after those three months are up, you're in a situation afterwards. So it's great that we have that, but it would seem that the focus would be more on um, addressing that issue. Has there been any real thought in terms of addressing the issue of the fact that so many families, predominantly women, need child care? So is it, is there, has the thought been, if this is the major challenge that women in the workforce are facing, how can we on a citywide and agency above and beyond, uh, above and beyond universal pre-K, pre, pre which is awesome, but in addition to paid family leave, there's that gap between three months and four years old um, and beyond in terms of after school, working late, weekends. Uh, someone in my district even came up with a concept called um, instead of daycare, night care, because there are so many families and women that are working jobs in the evening, that are working nights, that are going to school late. Has that been a thought in terms of how do we rectify um, this challenge so that all people um, can work equitably? Um, in terms of the work performed by DCAS, not to date, in terms of um, looking at um, programs such as night care, but um, to your other comments regarding challenges that women sometimes face relating to unconscious bias, um, one of the things that we did put in place was the training. And we also incorporated um, that within um, structured interviewing training as well to have individuals be more mindful of the areas in which they are biased to try to level the playing field for all applicants for positions. Mm -hmm. Have the data from the CEEDS um, ever been publicly available? Can you identify any potential problems with making them publicly available? Um, our concern about making it publicly available is um, uh, an employee's right to privacy, essentially. The information is reported on an individual basis. Notwithstanding, the SEEDS information directly feeds our workforce profile report that is um, provided online, as well as the EEO4 report that we share um, with the federal government every two years. So if I'm a African-American woman with a child, and I feel that through some water co cooler discussion, I feel that I've kind of stumbled on to the fact that um, potentially other people in my office, male colleagues, are making more money than I'm making currently. What avenue or what systems are in place for me to then verify, because you've spoken about the fact that you don't want people's internal information shared and that sort of thing. What I want to today is, is to, to end the chicken and egg cycle in terms of the fact that we're always saying we don't want to violate people's right to privacy, but at the same time we recognize that we have this huge um, wage gap that's uh, affecting people of color, women, and so forth. How do we break this chicken and egg scenario because we can't stay stuck with the fact that we don't want to um, violate anyone's uh, privacy, but we have to address this terrible inequity that's causing so many people from not being able to get ahead in life. Um, so to your first question in terms of the avenue that someone would pursue. Mm -hmm. So if someone believes that they are paid inappropriately or they believe that they're serving um, 
potentially in a, a title that they deem lower than the work that they've been assigned, there are three potential paths they can take. Um, for those titles that are represented by a CBA, sometimes those complaints come through labor, meaning that someone um, believes that they have an idle title grievance, they believe they're not serving the appropriate title or at the right level or at the appropriate salary. Um, as a result of that, that information is um, worked um, through via labor and the labor relations office assigned to that respective agency. And depending on the merits of the case, an investigation potentially would ensue. Um, additionally, um, there may be desk audits that are involved in that analysis as well to determine if there are merits to the claim. Um, um, an individual can also go to the HR professional if they have even anecdotal information to suggest that they believe that they are paid at levels um, below other individuals. At that time, that would prompt that HR professional to take a look at um, current salary, potentially within that office, looking at um, other um, individuals working within that agency in a similar title, and to get a sense of um, where folks stand with respect to compensation. And then the last um, place where an employee can go potentially would be through the EEO office. And in some cases, that could be um, a complaint related to compensation, but also tied to the protective class that someone is in. Um, and once again, depending on um, the merits of the complaint, uh, an investigation would ensue. But essentially, you as the employee would not have the power or the access to that information. You would then have to rely on third parties or other individuals in order to identify that information for you. Council member, information about all city employees and their salaries is publicly available. We put out a list in the civil list every year that um, shows the names and the uh, um, salary for every city employee. So that information is available to somebody who believes that he or she has been um, experiencing discrimination on the wage side. The, but is that what, information what is not, also available by race? It, it is not available by race or gender, and the reason for that is... But that's what this conversation <coughs> is specifically... And I'm getting to that. Okay. Um, as I think you know, the city makes a commitment to employees when they voluntarily disclose their race, their ethnicity, or their gender, that that information will be kept um, in the strictest confidence. And <clears throat> a principal reason for that is the concern that if it's not held in strict confidence, people will not report those demographic characteristics to the city, which will um, degrade the value of the data that we rely on to report to the federal government, which we have to do every two years, and to do our analyses and to make information available elsewhere where needed. Reporting the race and gender and ethnicity of 350,000 city employees in a public report that goes on, a net, on, on the internet each year poses a real danger to our ability to get cooperation from our workforce to provide that data to us. That's why last year when we discussed this bill, we proposed um, an alternative that would allow for meaningful analysis of wage disparities while at the same time maintaining that commitment to the security and the privacy of uh, race and gender and ethnicity information at the individualized level. It was um, an effort to um, provide a middle ground so that we continue to um, collect that data in a meaningful way, in an accurate way, and at the same time allow for analysis of the things that you're looking at. Are there differences in wage scales and, and wages between women and men in the same job categories uh, and so forth? What does meaningful more specifically mean? Because if we're discussing that we're not going to, uh, or rather, let me just ask you this question. Do you believe that there is inequity uh, in terms of pay across race and gender? I believe that um, there are different opportunities that have been open to women or to racial or ethnic minorities 
than to whites and to what titles they can go into. And that explains on an average basis why there are disparities uh, along those lines. Within titles, because um, for the vast majority of our employees, their wages are set through collective bargaining, um, men and women in the same titles tend to advance pretty much in lockstep. There are not great wage disparities within titles. Um, and so that's the answer to that question. How would you know that answer? Do you internally in your position have the ability to see disparities based off of race, sex, gender? Are you internally allowed to see that information or are you making a, a feeling assessment? No, well, actually, the, the, the um, public advocate recently reported on that mm -hmm. and showed that within titles, there's very little difference. Like a ten thousand dollar difference. Very little difference between the pay that men and women get, or that uh, white people and uh, and minorities receive within those titles. The disparity was really in the opportunity for women to move into certain positions. Um, there's been a historic. Um, inequality in the fire department. We, we all know that, and that's something that we're working on um, on a daily basis with, mm -hmm. with, in the court system. Um, and there are other examples like that. But within those job titles, there's, there's not a tremendous disparity. The CWA matter is slightly different because that was a change from uh, a managerial position to one that is represented in part, and that's what contributed to um, some differences in wages which are now being addressed. Um, Do you think that the CWA issue is different specifically because CWA publicly raised it, where there could be disparities similar to CWAs but haven't been raised with the same fort and well, force think, and might that CWA has? I think it's very much um, specific to the accretion process that occurred with CWA, and that's the root of the of the disparity that they um, claim to exist, but it's being negotiated now in good faith by both sides, under the supervision of a, a United States magistrate judge, and um, I have every confidence that it's going to come to a successful conclusion. And so, from from that, I just want to understand from let's just if we're talking about the CWA case, do you feel that? Uh, the victory in that will set a precedent that will also be employed throughout the city of New York? Uh, I think it's a very specific case, a specific to CWA. Okay. I'm going to, I want to ask um, more Shall specific questions, but I, I just wanted to make sure that no other members, because I don't want to lose members in the process of this. Okay, and then I'll come back to mine. Councilmember Perkins. So we have a problem. <laughs> Do we have a problem? Sir, do we have a problem? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page, just because I'm, we have a problem in terms of the disparities that this hearing is presently being conducted for. Would you acknowledge that? I would acknowledge that there are different opportunities available to um, women and men and in some categories to racial minorities and ethnics within the municipal workforce. And Would that contributes that? to uh, an average disparity in wages. Could, could you just elaborate a little bit more in terms of the specifics that you're familiar with? Like, for instance, it's, it, let's, let's assume that this, uh, this uh, ball is in your, paw, in, 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 in your ballpark, you know, like this, this hot rock is in your hands. How, how, we, how, how do we fix this? Considering the testimony and other information that we've received, what, what, are you, what do you propose, what, how, we, uh, steps that we should begin to take to fix this so that the outcry won't be so? Well, our approach would be to um, address um, the issue holistically, um, and some of that would involve. Now, before you say that, what does holistic mean? Because I always hear that word, it's, and I'm not sure you know, per person what that may mean. Holistic would be inclusive. And, and taking a really comprehensive way of addressing an issue. 
Um, and so with that, there are a few things. Um, implementation of best practices, some of which we've done. Um, in terms of Executive Order 21, it speaks to um, Chair Miller's um, concerns raised about there being gender and race neutrality as it relates to um, folks having a fair shot and an opportunity. Um, so with Executive Order 21 specifically, we mandated that agencies remove any information relating to salary history from their pre-employment applications and their employment applications. Um, additionally, we had um, agencies remove any information relating to set percentages for promotions removed from any of their policies and procedures. Um, and, and so, but um, separate and apart um, from that, um, as we mentioned, we are certainly open to working with the council because in terms of the spirit of intro 633, we share an agreement, you know, however, um, the path forward is what we like to work through and discuss with the council to figure out the best way to preserve the data that we're collecting um, and maintaining the privacy um, of the individuals we serve. I'm, I'm not some, I, I, I appreciate that and, and I, and I uh, uh, would, uh, hope that uh, we can continue to have this conversation uh, even after this moment. Um, but I want to, I'm trying to understand what, what, what we, what, how do we very specifically uh, move forward, um, not simply rhetorically, but just in terms of some steps that you, you, you're going to be laying out as per the, the subject matter today. Um, as I mentioned, there are some steps we've taken specifically related to Executive Order 21. In addition, um, you know, training that we provided across the agency where we've um, trained folks in structured interviewing, unconscious bias, because that also ties in with the person who ultimately receives the job or who is advanced. Um, we've also, um, and I don't know why I'm drawing a blank here, but um, We've also um, looked at inclusive recruitment, um, looking at those job categories where historically the candidate pool has not included women or people of color. And so working with agencies in order to have a diverse candidate slate in order to fill those positions, those are actionable steps that we have and we will continue to take to have diverse um, and inclusive workforce. So like for instance, there's a term, I guess it's supposed to be, uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. How do we do this in terms of something called be best practices? Some of the best. If you will use the best practices concept from your understanding of it, lay out how this this uh, uh, diversity problem would be solved. Some of the best practices have been implemented. And One of the best practices, but they haven't been solved, right? What, well, we are a large and dynamic city with over three hundred thousand employees. So I feel like every step. Is, is, is toward progress. So I don't think that there's one simple cure-all to um, address a long-standing issue. Um, that being said, some of the best practices include having parental leave programs in place, limiting um, discretion as it relates to salary setting. As mentioned previously, the discretion is really only with 7% of um, the titles in which, um, in, in which our workforce serves. Um, also, having more inclusive recruitment strategies that talk to the nature of diversity at all levels within government. So so some of the, those are some of the best practices that we've already put in place. I apologize if it seems as if I'm accusing you. I'm, I'm, no, no, no. I just, I just, I just want to be sure. I don't because, feel accused uh, at all. Sometimes these kind of conversations get a little touchy, because you know the, the um, best practices are, are being announced all the time, <laughs> and we're still where we are. The result is bad practices. And, and, and bad relationships and, and, and bad feelings and, you know, people are caught up in this discriminatory situation. So that's the, the reason why I'm asking, because the, the term best practices is, is magical <laughs> when you're trying to convince people that you're trying to do the right thing, but the facts don't re rep reflect that. And so how do we get there? I think an actionable next step, which we've you know, already indicated, is collaboration with the council to figure out where we can land with respect to the bill. We are not um, opposed to sharing information. It's just the, the current um, described path forward is, is not one that we're completely aligned with. But I certainly view that as, as a, a next step. And, and so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned alliances? 
Did I hear alliances? No, alignment. Oh, alignment. No, right. Alignment. The path forward, as described currently in intro 633, gives us some pause because we are concerned about the privacy of you know, our client base. That being said, um, we had, or we believe that we had come up with a solid middle ground to help achieve um, mutual goals. Our rights to preserving privacy and also um, the council's um, desire to have information that we can um, collaborate on and um, analyze. Okay, so what, do you have a sort of a schedule for when uh, some of these practices will unfold and become evident and manageable or at least measurable? Well, the best practices that I mentioned have already been instituted. In terms mm -hmm. of an actionable next step with the council, that would really, you know, be based on, you know, schedules between, you know, our legislative team and with the council to um, further refine the bill. Okay, so this is let's go. So in that in that vein, you have an idea when we're what is the plan? What is the schedule? When do, what are the milestones that we're going to be able to measure or see in terms of how these best practices are working out? Um, in terms of milestones that have been set, I mean, in terms of parental leave, we have information regarding the numbers of people who've actually um, taken parental leave, um, and we have that separated by gender and the length of time that they've used um, this benefit. Um, in terms of unconscious bias and structured interviewing, we collect training data, um, and we have um, certainly incorporated that in the diversity and EEO plans of every agency, which we review those updates that they provide to us. Those updates are sent to the council as well. Um, and so um, certainly, if, if there's a takeaway in terms of um, any information you'd like um, to know where we stand with respect to the implementation of those best practices, we can certainly furnish it. Right, thank, thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, boy, before I get, let me just jump in here real quick because, um, uh, Councilor, I have to say that I, 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 I just categorically dismiss the fact that because people aren't a part of a particular culture because you don't have firemen in your family you're not going to become a fireman or because you don't know for some reason or the other that there is a promotional opportunity or advancement that you're not going to take advantage. I don't think that is that simple. I think that we have been, in fact, we've introduced legislation about the online portal, uh, which is now up and running. And, and, and the reason why we requested that online portal, not just to make it easier for individuals to apply and become a public servant, but um, to be able to uh, report and account who is providing these services. And certainly just by the mere online portal and the data that is collected is, is information that is useful. And we know that is useful. I think that we have all agreed that is useful how we disseminate that information is important. To the degree, I, I think I have just about all agency data that was available and, and from those who have the highest number of white male dominated to the lowest to the male to the women uh, uh, dominated titles. The one that, the one exception is the one that we have all agreed that has not been in compliance that have been major parts of lawsuits and, and, and found themselves in the newspaper DOT that data is not available. Interestingly omitted. So with that being said, I, I think it's more of, of the culture and how do you change the culture in that the people that have the ability to promote, to uh, give increases in pay and compensation, um, those are the folks who have traditionally been doing that. And once you step outside of merit base and uh, contract with the negotiated salaries, we find a problem. That being said, getting back to the data and, and, and uh, rights of privacy, you're talking about the people, those civil servants have. I've had the pleasure of being a business agent and the president of, of, of a union that represented thousands of city employees and uh, public employees and I don't think any of them would have objected to information being revealed if it was a matter of getting to a matter of they were being uh, disproportionately 
undercompensated, number one. Number two, and most importantly, I, I, I think that there are certainly ways to disaggregate this information and this data through uh, uh, demographics, individuals, uh, in, uh, uh, individuals and levels, and degrees of accuracy of the data. Now, um, first of all, we're talking about titles, not necessarily individuals. And if, in fact, we were talking about the individuals itself, there are ways to read that simple data in alphanumerical, uh, deleting data, uh, dates, and, and, and other things that we could certainly, without identifying Mr. or Mrs. Jones, um, the fact of the matter is, having been a, we go by numbers, right? And the public doesn't have access to those numbers, nor does your colleague have access to your number, right? So no one will know who that individual is unless that individual uh, voluntarily gives up that information. My point is, is that there are a plethora of ways that we could arrive at the necessary data if we had the will to do it. I don't think it's as simple as we want to protect the integrity of someone's confidence because there's many, many ways to do it if we put our heads together. And I think that we have just identified several ways in which we could redact that information and, and, and make simple changes to be able to identify the individuals that were involved. Certainly, if I was involved or I thought in any shape, form, or fashion that I was being undercompensated, that someone who was doing the same job was being um, paid more or given an additional vacation day or being promoted, uh, whatever information that was necessary for us to prove uh, that to be the case and to bring justice to an unjust situation, I don't think that anyone would be um, uh, would deny that from, from occurring. So uh, have we attempted to uh, analyze this data in, in different ways, in, in such ways um, that we were redacting or did it alphanumerically or simply identified employees by their identification number, 607592, by the 832957, which is my pension number. Who knows? Right? But I, I mean, there, there are just a number of ways that we could identify each and every person in this room without identifying that person by his name or social security number. And certainly with the resources that we have sitting on that side of the table, that we could do that. It just has to be the will. With all respect, council member, we've looked at this issue very closely. <clears throat> it's very easy to reverse engineer the identities of people with alphanumeric anatomizing or with using other methods like identifications because the information that, that would be published under the current draft of this legislation would have numerous data points, the starting date, the wages, uh, I think six or seven data points in which it would be very easy based on information already in the public domain to identify the persons through reverse engineering by their race, ethnicity, and gender. <clears throat> and so that's why we're concerned about publishing data disaggregated at the individual level and have proposed an alternative which will allow for the analysis that you're looking for without um, trammeling on those individual privacy interests and degrading the class of data that we all want to collect. That's a stretch. I think that it certainly can be done, again, if the will is there to do it. Um, are we using the... Um, Here's a question. Um, I know council member mentioned, uh, asked the question earlier about how information was gathered on demographics and so forth. What happens when it is not self-reported? 
when the information, and so we actually have less than 12, excuse me, less than 10% of the city's workforce that chooses not to self-report. Um, in those cases, um, at the time of onboarding, there is what we call observed reporting, where um, an HR professional would have to make an observation in order to finish that transaction. However, that is not an ideal set of circumstances. We prefer the folks feel comfortable in disclosing um, their gender and ethnicity at the time of hire. Who are the HR professionals? Uh, is it someone during someone in HR during the time of hire? Is it someone mm -hmm. in the agency after a person is has already been employed? So there are three different touch points um, where individuals can voluntarily self-disclose. One would be at the time that they apply for a civil service examination. But once again, it's voluntary. Um, at the time of hire, that's when that observed reporting would take place. So if someone decided not to include that information on um, their hiring application via e-hire, the HR professional, and that could be anyone, an HR generalist, the analyst processing the transaction would then be required to provide that information. However, at the time that an employee decides to, to self-disclose, that would override anything that would have been um, considered absorbed reporting. So once again, our goal is to encourage people to disclose. Because obviously, um that is very subjective, and the person that was outside the individual themselves um, could be wrong. You're exactly right, and that's why the preferred approach is to have an environment in which people feel um, open and safe to provide, um, to um, self-ID accurately. And, and is, is there a point where it's recorded that it was done by a third party or an outside person other than a person, someone, um, I'm just trying to think about the actual screen. Um, I don't think it necessarily makes that distinction, but I, I would need to follow up on that. Council Member Cumbo. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller. I want to get right into the legislation and to gain a greater understanding of the, the elements of the legislation and what your thoughts are on it. So in your um, testimony, um, you stated that we support the spirit of intro 633 to increase the availability of data concerning how the city pays its employees in various job categories by race, ethnicity, and gender groups consistent with the privacy concerns of employees who voluntarily provide demographic information based on the city's commitment that an individual, individual's information will be held in strict confidence. So I wanna understand the spirit and bring the spirit into reality what are the what where is the space and time between the spirit and the reality in terms of your thoughts on this legislation and so when we say we agree with the spirit of it we do believe that this is um, certainly an issue that's worth um, and worthy of further analysis however our concerns are on um, reporting someone's individual information i think the city um, at large has really um, enjoyed a process whereby less than 10% of our population feel comfortable disclosing. We've also expanded our self-ID self categories to allow individuals to um, um, share with us if they are a disabled veteran or if they belong to one or more races, excuse me, two or more races. You know, um, our concern is really the degradation of the data going forward if we um, move forward with sharing individual information at the individual level. It just, we all know whether you can at this time specifically state that while you're at this hearing, we all know that there is a huge uh, inequity issue that's happening in terms of pay across the city. We understand that and we know that. But it seems as if because it's too difficult of a task or it would create such a new paradigm shift, it would expose too much of inequities that so many individuals have experienced for so long that we want to protect this system as, as it currently stands and exists because it's more comfortable to go along with what we've been doing than to uncover the real inequities that people have been dealing with for decades. And to say that, as according to Chair uh, Miller, there has to be a way that we can uncover this information. And if people 
And you know, we, we're saying this mostly impacts women who are faced with issues around childcare and how, God bless them, if they can go through all this data and determine that this person was hired on this date and this person works here and they figured out how to do this so it must be this person, if they can figure out all of that, then they absolutely deserve to be able to bring their case um, forward in that way. We have to figure out a real way, and I'm, and I'm not hearing it from this particular hearing that we're going to come to that middle ground that it's going to take um, in order to be able to um, push forward to uncovering this inequity. And I, and I also wanted to bring your attention to um, intro 752, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to creating an Office of Diversity and Inclusion within the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. So I wasn't clear on your thoughts um, in terms of your feedback on Intro 752. Certainly we're supportive. We've had an office that um, handles much of what's described in the intro for the last 30 years, as I've mentioned. Um, we would also welcome the opportunity to talk to the council about um, some additional ways to refine the bill. Um, one of the concerns that we had was specifically around the assignment of benchmarks or potentially affirmative hiring because we need to um, take into account the fact that um, City of New York is a civil service municipality. And so having specific diversity goals when you have um, a test-based system is actually something that is, is it's, it's nearly impossible to navigate because at the time that you take an exam, your race and your gender aren't um, part of um, your score or your rank on a list. So certainly supportive of having the office, very happy to have the office. We also wanna be sure that um, the legislation doesn't necessarily restrict the scope of the office because we take pride in over the last 30 years continuing to expand our mission to tackle issues that are timely and relevant. So we don't wanna lose that flexibility um, and we wanna to continue to grow our service delivery to the city. It's more the importance of codifying it so that it lasts throughout administrations. But also at the same time, as was brought up earlier, we need real benchmarks. And coming out of this hearing, I'm not understanding what the benchmarks are. For example, with Vision Zero, we have a clear vision. We want to see no fatalities as a result of uh, vehicular um, accidents or car crashes. You know, when it comes to um, any of the other elements that we have in terms of NWBE participation and wanting to see that. But it seems like we have no clear goals or benchmarks as it relates to pay inequity. I, I, I further want to press upon that in terms of what are the goals or the benchmarks and how do we reach them um, if not wanting to disclose this information. And through the work that you do internally, are you internally working collectively, effectively um, in order to root out um, issues of pay disparities or inequities, even when a case is not brought forward? Is this something that um, through the current office that exists or others, that you're actively going through the process of righting the wrongs um, that have been happening for so many decades? Um, I would say um, there has been work that has been done um, in terms of periodic salary reviews. Um, there have been cases in which um, personal actions have been put forth um, where requests for parity adjustments have been made. Um, once again, looking at a host of factors, conducting desk audits to look at um, work that is being performed by someone in a similar title with similar tenure, education, and experience. So yes, that work. Um, is really kind of an ongoing um, practice at um, agencies across the city. And once again, that is work that ties in with that HR professional that, and, and the EEO um, professional as well. Do you feel like this work is aggressive? Um, I think that there are opportunities. Potentially. Your answers aren't sounding very confident on these things. Um, I'm just being very deliberate okay. <laughs> in what I'm saying, but, but I do believe there have been some aggressive efforts. There have been um, cases in which there have been large-scale promotions offered to some, and we had to ask agencies to rescind those actions. I mean, so it really depends on the nature of the case. I do think that um, as a city, we have made strides, but that is not to suggest that there's not more work to do. And I did want to just comment on um, just the comment about our will. 
I think that you know over the administration, DCAS has not shied away from any lift with respect to data transparency collaboration. And so certainly, if, if you believe that you're not hearing our willingness to work and collaborate with the council, that's not where we sit today. We are certainly open to figuring out the best way to, um, to not only um, produce the data, but to do it in a way that we also meet um, our reporting requirements and our obligations to the clients we serve. So it is not that we are not here with a willingness to move forward. And I hear you on that but our obligation is to make sure that we protect those 300,000 plus workers to make sure that they have the pay equality that they need to lead their homes and to lead their lives and to have the best chance forward. I'm gonna ask one more question and then turn it over because we have a number of advocates. How many complaints is DCAS aware of relating to discrimination faced by the city's civil servants? I don't have that number. Um, the complaints that we receive are captured in our online um, complaint tracking system, and primarily they're tied to um, a complaint related to a protected class. As you know, that could be age, race, um, uh, sexual orientation, and so um, certainly um, if, if, if that's information that you'd like, I can provide it to your office. Would you say at this given time, because we would like this before the hearing closes, would you say that that's information that's um, in the dozens, in the hundreds, in the thousands? Potentially the hundreds. This is certainly in the hundreds, and the information is provided to DCAS, to the mayor's office, and to the council and the on EEC. a quarterly basis. So you have that information, or should have that information available to you now, on the quarterly reports that have been uh, flowing into your offices since 2012, I believe. I'm glad that it's easily accessible, so I hope that I can get that from you today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Cumbo. And before I turn it over to my esteemed colleague over here, I just have, I, I want to go back to that data and, and, and data. Have, have, has DKS tried uh, the regression analyst as, as was done in the uh, CWA, C, CWA 1180? case and I, and I know that it was ruled that that was a method that should be used. Um, is that applicable here as we move forward? We, we proposed a different approach which was to provide um, data for each agency in the city uh, in a frequency table that showed the full-time employees <coughs> excuse me by their agency by their EEO4 gr job groups, um, by their job categories, by their race and gender and ethnicity, at a level that would allow for meaningful analysis without disclosing the identity of the individuals. That was a draft proposal that we shared with the council when 1536 was under consideration last year. And we thought that we had meaningful understanding of the value of that proposal last year and we're willing to continue to propose that or to see if there are any enhancements that can be made to that proposal that will meet the objectives of both of the council and of the concerns about the privacy of the data that people voluntarily disclose. So that information and in, in that process was, was volunteered uh, by virtue of an arbitration or court case with but not applicable to what we are trying to accomplish here, simple uh, pay equity? No, no, it's, it would be for the entire city. It's not a matter of arbitration. No, I'm saying right now you would be willing to, to aggregate that data in, this, in that manner now as we move forward. Yes, that's okay, the proposal great. we made last year. Yes, that's what we agreed to last year. Great, and, and, and finally, um, we talked a bit about D, uh, DOT. And is there a reason why the DOT, uh, according to uh, the DCAS reports, was we were unable to um, get this information? Was, was it not classified according to its code, particularly street, uh, street and highway repairs? I don't know if I'm right. Um, are you referring to the information that was in pu the public advocate's report specifically relating to DOT? Nope. Nope. No? No. I, we were, a lot of this information is readily available. What was not 
was information, uh, a lot of information was omitted from the Department of Transportation. They're a department that have had uh, a, a long history of lacking diversity. And so specifically with um, DOT and, and... So those particular titles were titles that we were not able to access information from. Those are titles um, that aren't competitive titles and certainly aren't diverse. And as we talked about one of the many labor class, they are labor class, um, they're a, not labor class, they're labor class laborers, but not open competitive. Uh, with their salaries uh, far beyond that of the other three or four other labor titles that we see here in the city of New York? I'm sorry, I feel like I'm not following because I know that you mentioned that the information was not readily accessible. It wasn't but, but, accessible at right, all. So, so what source are you referring to where you had access to other information but not information about DOT Through labor? Through DCAS. Through a report that yeah. we forwarded to you? No. The EEO. You mean the EEO-4 report? Function codes. Okay, because with the EEO-4 report, the information is um, it's aggregated, and it aligns with different job categories. So you would have a mixture of titles that are falling within those categories. It wouldn't speak to just one title. That information is aggregated, and that's a federal requirement. We were able to pull out information in, in, in laborers except for in that title. In, in, in the labor title, but not in that agency. Found it funny because that's the agency that has had a history of problems. Right, because we could. So you know what? Right. How about you just uh, agree that you, you're going to provide that information to the committee as we move forward? I just need to have specifics on the title that you're referring to, but we collect data on every title. So we, that's yeah, because why I'm not we following. had this conversation about that title. And the question in the past was, why wasn't it a competitive title? In hearings here, we've had that question. Okay, so we'll right, look so as it. we go forward, mm -hmm. there is somewhere where it's, it's glaringly uh, lacking of diversity, and they uh, that is uh, kind of exactly what we're talking about today, where people do the same job or compensated differently. And okay. certainly you, you, you uh, indicated that where you have civil service that there is, you can control through merit base what salaries are. Um, and when you have these non-competitive, gotta know somebody titles, it's a little different, okay? Um, now I'm gonna turn that over to my colleague Councilmember Eugene, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Miller. So it seems that all of uh, the questions has been answered already, and I'm going to ask you some few questions because there are so many people who want to testify, and for the sake of time. But uh, Councilmember Combo asked a question about the complaint. So could you? Tell us, how do you handle the complaint when you receive the complaints? What are the steps that you use to handle the complaints? What happened? You know, what are the most common complaints that you receive? Um, once again, the complaints are tied, if, if you're talking about complaints that are submitted to an EEO professional, yep. um, those complaints would tie to um, one of the 19 protected classes. Um, that being the case, at the time that a complaint is submitted, and it can be submitted in writing, it can be submitted um, verbally, um, or even anonymously, um, based on the complaint, there's an intake process where there, um, if the complainant is available, that there is an interview to determine the merits of the claim. And um, so there are a couple of paths that um, are reviewed at that point. If the nature of the complaint could be satisfied potentially through mediation, that is an option forward. If there's a referral that needs to happen either to HR or to a disciplinary body, and it doesn't necessarily tie with an EEO specifically, then that referral is made. However, if an EEO investigation needs to be conducted, then the investigative process um, would be conducted by that EEO professional. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Councilmember Danis was talking about uh, the management and the leadership, the representation of the people that we are serving. 
But I don't recall that you mentioned the step that will be taken by your agency to ensure that uh, there's a, a good representation of the people that we are serving in terms of leadership and management. Well, as I mentioned, um, DCAS has a decentralized hiring process. And yes, we do set forth policy, but hiring decisions are made at the agency level by that agency head. Um, some of the positions that were referenced earlier by um, one of the other council members in terms of the executive leadership, those are appointments. And those folks serve in what we call exempt class titles. These individuals are appointed by the commissioner of that agency. Um, notwithstanding, um, we do review um, the composition of um, the city's workforce at its highest levels. Um, and while, yes, we have made strides over the last 10 years to have um, a female um, majority in terms of the city's workforce and a minority majority, um, it does not negate the fact that there's more work that can be done to have um, a leadership across the city that's reflective of um, the city's client base. But is there any role that your agency can take and play in terms of uh improve the diversity at the level of the management and nomination for the management position? You're asking if there's a role that DCAS can play in nominating? Mm. Um, in some cases, we're asked to sit on um, interview pools or recommend um, uh, candidate slates. But once again, that appointment is made by the agency head. For all intents and purposes, that agency is that agency head's business um, to run. And so um, they make the final decisions as it relates to hiring. We do also participate in a vetting process um, in working with City Hall at the time um, where there are leadership positions that are going to be filled. Specifically in the equity and inclusion space, we actually conduct a vetting meeting with any um, um, EEO officer serving at the executive level at an agency. Uh, I'm going back uh, to your testimony. You say that our primary mission is to ensure that the city's equal employment opportunities, EEO policy, and EEO-related responsibilities under the New York City Charter are followed both in letter and spirit. How do you ensure that uh, those responsibilities and policy are followed really? How do you ensure that happen? Well, the first thing that we do, we require, and this is mandatory, that all agencies submit a diversity and EEO plan. It's basically their annual plan where they lay out recruitment goals um, using workforce utilization information. They talk about training goals, diverse recruitment. Um, so it really runs the gamut to ensure that that agency head first and, um, and, and the EEO professional are making a commitment to having a more diverse and inclusive workforce. Um, there's also um, a policy statement that agency heads are required um, to release to their agency committing to um, diversity and equal employment opportunity. The way we check with agencies, not only do we review their plans that they submit and we finally approve them, um, as they're providing quarterly updates, that information is shared with us as well as um, with the mayor's office and the council, um, highlighting their commitment to diversity and inclusion and also to make sure that um, they keep pace with the goals that they've outlined at the beginning of the year. I think that uh, you mentioned training you know, for the agent, you know, uh, to uh, to help agencies uh, meet their goals. But in addition to that, is there any other thing that you do to help them reach the goal and comply with uh, the requirements? Definitely, as it relates to recruitment, we review the recruitment goals that agencies have outlined. We also offer any assistance that they may need. Some agencies, um, unfortunately, don't have staffing enough to have um, dedicated recruitment um, resources. And so the Office of Citywide Recruitment, as the best as we can, we try to um, supplement that at the agency level. So what about if they don't reach the goal or they don't comply with the requirement? What is the position of DCAS? What, what are the steps? What do you do? to remedy the situation? Um, with any goal, if, if someone um, falls short of that, we certainly meet with them to find out what barriers or issues arose that stopped them from meeting that recruitment goal. That could be, um, although they had cast a wide net, that potentially they didn't have the number of candidates that they anticipated for a particular job. So it really depends on that specific issue. So uh, could you tell us why does uh, the workforce report 
not all fell broke down of salary, promotion, senior position according to the race and gender. Why not? Um, I don't necessarily have a firm answer on that. The workforce profile report is actually something that's not legally required. It's something that um, DCAS originally had worked on with the mayor's office operations to really um, provide greater transparency around um, on the city's workforce. So with each iteration, we've continued to improve upon the reporting. Our first report that was released did not include DOE or H&H or SCA. Our next iteration was more of a one city report that provided um, the full breadth of titles covered by the city. Um, so certainly it's something we can look into and explore, but it was not necessarily something intentional. I'm glad that you mentioned this is a transparency issue and I also accountability. And we would appreciate if you, you know, your agency, DCAS can do any effort to make sure that we have those indication information in the report because it is very important for the public to know. We got to know where we are at in terms of diversity in the, in the uh, workforce in New York City. I think that, uh, is there any other recommendations, something that you would advise to do to ensure that the, at the level of the city and any area, you know, management, leadership, and the workforce any recommendations, something we can do together, the CAS, the city council, the mayor office, something we can do together to work to, to ensure that we improve the diversity in terms of the workforce, in terms of the position in New York City, what would it be? I think, um, I think the path that we're on um, is actually the right one in terms of understanding the importance of data. Um, one thing that we um, share with HR and ER professionals is that you need to let the data drive the work to help it inform policy and decision making going forward. I think that um, certainly there's a willingness, you know, between DCAS and the council to get to um, the right way to not only review the data, but to help, help it inform our collective responses to these issues. Uh, it, it, some people came to me and they mentioned that uh, they would like to, they have the qualification, they have the skill for certain position in the city, but they don't know how to navigate, what to do. So is there anything that DCAS can do because uh, to help people uh, uh, access, uh, get access to the leadership or management position, it may happen that uh, there are people, they are qualified, they got the skill, but they don't know what to do to get access to those levels. Is there anything that DCAS can do, or is there anything that you can propose mm -hmm. in terms of helping those people, you know, from different ethnic background, different social economic situation, who are qualified, who could be also at the higher level? Is there anything that DCAS can do, or we can do, to help them gravitate and go to that level? Um, I think that the first step is working with the agency's career counselor. Every agency, and I believe it's a charter requirement that requires that every agency have a designated career counselor. In their respective capacity, they, um, they provide a service similar to what you mentioned, helping someone to best navigate their career, whether it's through a civil service pathway or whether it's um, through um, just advancement opportunities. So I think that that's certainly a solid first step. There's another uh, very important uh, issue, a very important big step that we made in the city of New York, the workers' uh, parental leave. Do the union workers, do they have that also? Um, as it stands now, um, it is for managers and original jurisdiction employees. My understanding is that potentially um, separate unions are bargaining on that issue, but, but I don't have any um, more information with respect to that. Okay. Uh, I think that's all for my question because uh, we have to go to, to the next panel. There are so many people who want to testify. And I'm sorry, if I may, we actually have the number of complaints for- I'm sorry? Um, um, com uh, Council Member Cumbo had asked us for the total number of complaints for um, the third quarter fiscal year 18, so I wanted to make sure I left that with you. Mm -hmm. There were a total of 179 internal complaints made to the EEO office. How many complaints? 179. Can you give us the breakdown? The breakdown would have to be a takeaway, but I can certainly ensure you have that information tomorrow. So would you send it to our office to the 
I certainly will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for your testimony. Thank you for and your thank time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Just one second, please. I think that Shamila, you have any question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Equal opportunity. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to double check. Uh, is the Commissioner of Equal uh, Employment Opportunity is in the audience, please? The Commissioner of Equal Oppo Employment Opportunity, would you employment practices practice commissioner? commissioner? Is that her? Which one is? In accordance with the rules of the council, I will now administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. If you'd please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Can you repeat that? Are, are you saying that you're, you're doing the affirmation for mayoral testimony? I'm sorry? No. Can you repeat that? The affirmation? No, what, oh. the reason for it. So, with the any time a mayoral administration, uh, we're an or independent age agency, not a mayoral. Excuse and me. this is a city council commissioner. She was appointed by the city council. So I'm not sure that applies to us. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, would you like me to focus on anything specific? Or should we start with questioning? Or should I just present the no, testimony? Do you have the testimony? Yes. You want to read it? Okay. Read it and go, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the Civil Service, uh, the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'm Sharice Terry, the Executive Director of the New York City Equal Employment Practices Commission. This commission, represented by Commissioner Malini Daniel, appears before you today to present testimony on introduction number 0755-2018, which would require the EPC to analyze and report annually on whether agencies are meeting their racial and ethnic affir affirmative uh, employment goals, and when not, identify the underutilized or adversely impacted group, and provide recommendations and corrective action. 
It would also require the EPC to report aggregate citywide and data and provide recommendations to improve diversity in recruitment, selection, retention, and promotion of city em government employees for five years. <coughs> Excuse me. The EPC is an independent non-mayoral city agency empowered to monitor and evaluate agencies to ensure that they maintain effective equal employment opportunity or EEO for employees and applicants from protected groups. Chapter 36, section 831 D5 of the C New York City Charter empowers the EPC to audit and evaluate the employment practices and procedures of city agencies and their efforts to ensure fair and effective equal employment opportunities for women and minority employees and applicants seeking employment. Section 831 D2 and 832C authorizes the EPC to make a determination that any plan, program, procedure, approach, measure, or standard does not provide equal employment opportunity, require appropriate corrective action, and monitor the, the implementation of the corrective action it prescribes. Agencies which fall under the EPC's jurisdiction are those which are funded in whole or in part by the city treasury or where a majority of the board members are appointed by the mayor or where the majority of the board members serve by virtue of being city officers. There are approximately 140 agencies which consist of the office of the mayor and mayoral agencies, the, city, the New York City Council, the borough presidents, the district attorneys, the community colleges, public administrators, and community boards. The city charter assigns the EPC powers and duties which include but are not limited to requesting and receiving information and assistance as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of the charter and requiring reviewing and providing suggestions on the uniform standards, procedures, and programs of DCAS and city agencies. The EPC addresses its mandate and the requirements of intro 755218 through its audits. The EPC the EPC's Equal Employment, Equal Employment Practices Audit, I'm sorry, EPA, which specifically relates to the proposed legislation was conducted during 2016 and 2017. The EPA requires agencies to analyze their workforce statistics, determine whether or not there's underutilization, assess their selection procedures to determine whether job qualifications and criteria are job related and required by business necessity, and develop prospective recruitment and selection strategies that increase employment opportunities in job groups where underutilization is present. The EPA's methodology includes the collection and analysis of documents, records, and data that an agency provides in response to the EPC's document and information requests, the review of diversity and EEO plans and quarterly reports for each mayoral agency and similar reports for non-mayoral agencies, and the analysis of utilization data from the citywide equal employment opportunity database system, which is provided to the EPC quarterly by DCAS. The EPC's analysts use the SEEDS data to ascertain the concentrations of race or gender groups within the agency's workforce as well as underutilization. Where underutilization is revealed, the EPC's analysts assess whether an agency has undertaken measures to address it. As part of an audit, the EPC issues a preliminary determination letter, which includes an evaluation of the agency's efforts. The EPC requires corrective action if necessary and attaches the SEEDS report for reference. In 2016, the EPC initiated the automation collection and tracking of agencies' responses during the compliance monitoring phase of their audit via the use of Teammate, which is an automated management software. At the end of a four-year cycle, all agencies under the EPC's jurisdiction would have uploaded responses in Teammate, which would facilitate an appropriate comparison. The EPC's Board of Commissioners adopts a resolution whenever determination is issued and again when the agency completes yeah. the charter-mandated compliance monitoring period. Currently, the EPC's resolutions, which indicate the corrective actions each agency has received and implemented, are available via the EPC's annual reports, the EPC's website, the New York City M Municipal Archives and Library, and by a direct request from the EPC's office through a Freedom of Information Law request. In addition, the EPC provides underlying audit 
documents to the Department of Records and Information Systems for the New York City Municipal Archives and Library and in direct response to FOIL requests. In short, the EPC evaluates, monitors, and publishes workforce diversity efforts through its audits. Accordingly, under our current mandate, the EPC performs a substantial portion of what the legislation is, the legislation proposes. Since a separate report as required by interest 755-2018 may create redundancy, the EPC is open to meeting with the council and continuing a dialogue on how we may refine our approaches to make our information more accessible. Thank you very much. Councilman. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to your, uh, for your testimony. Can you explain how the e e e EEPC measure on their utilization at agencies? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Can you explain how the EEPC measure the on the utilization? How do we measure underutilization? Explain. Okay. You know, so, the underutilization. I thought you would ask that. So I brought with me a siege report. This okay. is the, the famous siege report that everyone's been talking about today. Uh -huh. um, to protect the information, I brought the council's siege report so that you can look at your own. Um, sorry. I can pass this around, but this report is provided by DCAS, and I guess the highlighted areas is what you would look at, or the areas that are indicated, indicates you, shows underutilization, and the EPC also tracks underutilization in our own database, which is this page, and you can, you can pass these around so that they can have a visual. Those reports are provided to the EPC mm -hmm. quarterly from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. So you provide the report, but can you explain that, you know, can you explain, what can you see about? Uh, so I, I don't, I gave you the report, but the areas that are marked you indicate where there's been a utilization analysis to show whether or not the agency's workforce compares to the availability data that the agency recruits from. So if there are more agent, there are more, there's more of an availability of people with that skills in the work in the labor market than there is in the agency's workforce, then it would indicate you, which is underutilization. So how uh, uh, do you know, EEPC and all systemic underutilization? How do you handle that? What, 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 uh, what has been done? How do we? You handle that, the underutilization. How do we end it? You handle it. What is the step? Hinder it? How yes. do we hinder it? I'm sorry. Uh, here I brought another report of, this is an EPC's preliminary I'm sorry, you know, the report we can get it and when we go to the office, go over it, but can, what can you say about that? So what That's we do is, when we find that there's underutilization, which is indicated in that report, in the employment practices audit, from the testimony I just read, what we do is we go to the agency and we figure out how did, does the agency, first of all, know that they have underutilization and in what job groups? So in our preliminary determination, we will make a, a finding that the agency has underutilization or not. We monitor the agency after that to see whether or not they, the agency has conducted an adverse impact study to see if any of their selection criteria is impacting, is the reason why they have underutilization, or we look at where they've recruited if there's an unutilization of, let's say, blacks or Hispanics, we look at where they've recruited in the, the job that has the underutilization. If they haven't recruited in, if they haven't done targeted recruitment, we recommend that they do targeted recruitment. We monitor the agency for six months, and then we see exactly where they've recruited and whether or not they've come up with a plan to remedy the underutilization 
So it's all in our preliminary determinations, our final determinations, and our compliance monitoring reports, where we monitor the agencies for six months. Uh, defining the data that you have collected, are they available to the public? The resolution where the commission makes a vote on what findings the EPC has made is available to the public. What's also available to the public is whether or not the agency has complied with the recommendations that we've made. These do the underlying audit documents, because they're so voluminous, are available as a part of a FOIL request, or we make them available to the city library. But so, the commission, what's on our website is the resolutions that the commission votes on, which tells the, the public exactly what recommendations were made to the agency. Thank you for being there. You know, this is uh, obviously you say you, you do very important work, but you kind of exist in obscurity that we, you know, we didn't even know you were in the room here. So um, with that being said, how, how many other, are, are you overseeing any recent legislation or any other legislation? You talked about the commission and, and the work that they do, but any legislation that the, the council has passed um, over the past few years, are you working, uh, are you, overseeing that or playing any role in the implementation or oversight? We were, we presented testimony on, uh, I can't remember the, 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 the sexual harassment uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. um, the data that we receive that you have in front of you is very important, but we do not receive aggregate complaint data. We've requested that data from DCAS and we haven't been able to get it. Um, we've also requested salary data, which we haven't been able to Which receive. data? Salary data. Okay. The same data that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. So we have those two pieces of, uh, of data would be very helpful in our audits because, well, one, we're conduct this year we're conducting sexual harassment prevention audits. So that would be helpful in understanding. We get complaint data individually from agencies, but the agency would have to be under audit for us to get the data. We would prefer to get it in aggregate so that we can target our audits towards agencies that may have more complaints than others. Um, and in terms of the salary data, it would obviously would be helpful in helping us understand where there's occupational segregation or where, you know, salary plays a role in um, So what is employment. it that facilitates your audit? I know that you're required to do annual or, uh, audits. How do you determine which agency is going to be audited? Right now, primarily, we do it on a quadrennial cycle, which is dictated by the charter. So every four years, we audit the 140 agencies that are under our jurisdiction. It's just sort of a rotating cycle. Okay. However, if there is an issue, there has been, I think in the APC's history, there was maybe a request once or twice by the council uh, to audit a particular agency. I would have to look. We, we, we can also audit agencies if CCHR requests that we audit an agency. Mm -hmm. um, or if we see that there's a particular problem at an agency. But because we're so short staffed, it's, we're, we're, we have a headcount of 14. Um, but we don't have 14 analysts, which are the people that conduct the audits. So we usually, we're, we're on a rotating cycle and we usually do it once every four years if we can get around. So let me share seats. this, because I, I, I know that my, my, my colleagues would concur. This is so important that when we, uh, the legislation around the online portal and the other DCAS stuff that we talked about today in years past that we had uh, 
included some funding in the budget for them to hire staff to, to reduce their provisional to uh, um, workforce and, and some other things there that was attached to it. Um, certainly, a staff of 14, it, it would be very difficult for you to really uh, drill down on the information that is necessary. To, this is that vital, you know, um, pay equity and ensuring that we have an equitable workforce that reflects the diversity and the values of the city is, is certainly um, something that's worth investing in. And, and, and perhaps, you know, um, we could offline um, between our committees and, and, and certainly sit down with the uh, speaker staff and talk about that. And, and that would be really great. Are, are, are there any examples of non-compliance that you've come across in, in audits? Yes. <laughs> we always come across non-compliance. Okay. Um, rarely do we audit agencies that do not have corrective actions. It happens, but it rarely happens. Agencies that may not have corrective actions are really tiny agencies. We have desk audits that we do for agencies like community boards. Um, we've had a few agencies that have had maybe for the com their complaint investigations may not have, have, have had corrective actions. But for the most part, with the employment practices audit, the, the one that you would be interested in, we haven't had any agencies that haven't had corrective actions. There were agencies that were non-compliant. Right, non-compliant, well, non-compliant meaning, corrective action meaning that they were non-compliant in certain areas. So when it, during our audits, we look at the distribution of the, the, the EEO policies. We look at the employment practices, recruiting, hiring, and promoting. That includes underutilization and adverse impact. We look at well, we would, career we, counseling. We, we would DOE, D, DOT rank. Have you I didn't bring them that recently? information with me, but we have done a recent audit of DOT. Okay. Ma I, I think, actually, we just did a second audit of DOT, which may be on the, the agenda for our next commission meeting, which is uh, in May. Okay. So we, we could expect to I see that. I would be able to, right. I would and, of course, FDNY would be low-hanging fruit, right? <laughs> <laughs> FDNY has improved. Um, that's as much as I'm, I'm going to say about the FDNY. Okay, so, and, 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 and basically the audits are, are done for the most part just based on uh, a, a, a annual or by a court. Right, we, we put them on a rolling cycle and if we haven't gotten around to auditing an agency within the past four years, then that, that agency okay. would and, and if, if there is uh, particular interest from the council or the admin or somewhere, then, then, then you would have that audit as well. Right. I think okay. it's written into the charter that as wow. requested by the council and the CCHR. Okay. So uh, aside from the audit, whatever so. information data it, it, do, are you responsible for? Primarily audits. Um, we're also responsible for reviewing the, the overall processes of DCAS. Um, and DCAS's, I guess, measurements or standards or whatever they put forth for city agencies, mm -hmm. we should be um, involved in, in reviewing. So we review if, let's say DCAS comes up with a new uh, format for the agency-specific plans that agencies submit. Every year, the agency, each city agency has to submit an agency-specific EEO plan. I think now they call it the D diversity and EEO plan. We would be responsible for reviewing the format that they're asking the agencies to submit it in. Um, the city agencies also submit quarterly reports on how they're implementing the, the agency-specific plan. The EPC receives those do you also. Do you receive those timely? No, actually, one of our most popular recommendations is that 
agencies are not don't submitting. submit the right. However, I would say the mayoral agencies submit submit the quarterly plans more frequently of course. Than, than the non mayorals. Okay. Um, the non mayorals actually, I, I'm not sure whether or not some non mayorals submit quarterly plans. Okay. But so, um, so could you could you just for future references could could the could this committee um, have that information of what agencies are specifically aren't in compliance have not submitted the necessary uh, reporting? Yeah, I think we sent this to the committee members or maybe the chairperson. Our annual report has the most frequent corrective actions, and we list all of the agencies and the recommendations that they've gotten. Okay, could you send it also to the Committee on Civil Service and Labor? Yes. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Councilmember Cumble. I'm gonna keep my remarks or questions brief, although I have many more because I know that the room um, needs to be utilized shortly. Okay. So just wanted to, so, do you believe that the, the work of your office is important and if it were to disappear, it would be a great loss to the city? Yes. Absolutely. So the legislation that I've put forward is, is in many ways to codify an existing office so that via one administration to the next, um, an office such as this doesn't disappear. And so would you believe that it's important for this office to continue and to um, do the work despite an administration that may not feel that equity is important? Yes. Awesome, so we are on the right track there. <laughs> I'm answering um, for the commissioner, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is good. I'll stick with this line of questioning. Um, because this would allow the city council to conduct greater oversight over the issue and make amendments to the mandate of the office as necessary, which is important. And currently where the differences are, there's still inadequate transparency in how the office implements and evaluates diversity policies. While the workforce report is very comprehensive, it does not track promotions and upward mobility of minorities in city government. And that information is very important, and that's part of the reason for this legislation. There are also no gender or racial breakdowns for salary brackets. So while you may feel that a lot of this work is being done under the banner of the office, there's still much more to do, and this legislation will um, empower the office to do so much more work, which is um, what I'm sure you all want to do is to get to the heart of this matter. So that completes my questions and I'll turn it back over to the chair. Yep, so can the uh, two committees expect that infom uh, the information along with the, uh, the majority leader? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your testimony and so glad that you hung around and that we had the opportunity to see what uh, important work that is being done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Can Thank I just you. make one small statement here? Oh, absolutely. I, the, the EEPC has been, um, we have ostensibly five commission members, and for about four years now, we have actually been operating with just four commission members, and that's because we have not had a chair appointed to the commission. And so we are, I'd like to think, a very collegial group that tries to operate on consensus because a common understanding and agreement in how to move forward on equal employment um, in regards to the agencies is very important. Uh, a chair is vital. Um, a fifth member is vital to successful continued operation, I would say. Thank you so very much for that information. That is critical information as to Mr. how chair. serious this is being taken. Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to th thank you for your testimony and thank you also for the information. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next panel, Ms. Gloria Middleton, Vincent Varial, Varial, Drew Bozelai, Warren. It was good. Delaney. And Delvaney Powell. Okay. Okay. 
I, I'm sorry, panel, but we are go going to put, be on a two-minute clock f for each person for initial testimony. And we could... They're going to put us out of the room real quick. Uh, how about we begin on this end? Delane? Yeah. Dear Chair Chairman, thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of intro 633. My name is Dalvin e. K. Powell, President of the United Probation Officers Association. I represent more than 700 probation officers and supervising probation officers by the New York City Department of Probation and more than 400 retirees of New York City Department of Probation. We are predominantly female and predominantly of color. Our members have suffered a severe and chronic suppression of our salaries. We face unrealistic and unfair barriers to promotion and pay increases. We are undervalued compared to others who serve in law enforcement. We are entitled to and need the data the city refuses to turn over to us with regards to the race and gender of our members to better understand the problems with pay disparity our members face so we can solve the problem. There is a unity of interest and pay disparity and knowledge is power. Providing this data is the first step in understanding and ending pay disparity in the city of New York. Some have pushed back claiming that disclosing the, the race and gender of individuals is an invasion of privacy, but this is just an excuse. First of all, as public employees, employees we already have a lowered expectations of privacy. Our name, positions, title, salary, even locations where we work is published on the website for the general public. So I ask you, how is releasing my gender and race more private? And who here does not know my race and gender? <laughs> of course, privacy is important, but it cannot be used as an excuse to avoid an equally important right of all New York City employees, which is to work in an environment free of discrimination and to, be, and to be paid fairly for the work that we do. I thank the council for holding this hearing and hope you will work quickly to pass intro 633 to ensure the city provides this, this aggregated data that includes employees race and gender in addition to the information already provided. As public employees, we give this information to the city voluntarily and with the understanding that it will be used for this purpose. This, this bill will ensure the city do, do what is required to and help take the steps for pay, paying equality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Miller and Eugene, uh, Majority Leader Combo, Councilmember Perkins. Uh, my name is Paul Newell. I'm with the Curland Group, and I'm appearing on behalf of uh, Vincent Variali, President of local, local 3621, who had to appear on court today on a related matter, on a related Article 78. Um, uh, Vincent Variali is the President of Local 3621, the uniformed EMS officers union representing over 500 EMS lieutenants and captains in the New York City Fire Department. Um, thank you for giving us a chance to speak in support of Intro 633, which would amend the administrative code to ensure disclosure of necessary data to ensure pay equity. Uh, we appreciate the actions taken by the City Council in advancing this legislation to ensure the City provides disaggregated data of race and gender along with pay information to help address pay inequity in the City workforce. Um, just to put in perspective how reasonable it is that this information be turned over, I want to explain. When every employee starts working at the City of New York, they fill out a form. One of the pages asks if you would like to voluntary, voluntarily disclose your race and gender in an EEO section. It is also disclosed that while this will be, that this will be kept confidential within the agency, it will be disclosed in accordance with the law, such as a request for the data under FOIL. So this is optional information, voluntarily given, which is expressly disclosed to employees will be turned over to others in accordance with the law. Yet the city claims that giving this information to us so that our statisticians can perform a regression analysis to determine where discrimination is happening among our ranks would be violating to those employees' privacy. In fact, just today, 
we have to appear in the New York, in New York State Court in an Article 78 that we had to bring to force the city to turn this data over, despite the fact that other unions have already won decisions in state courts, such as the Communication Workers of America Local 1180, who just a little over a year, year ago had to file their own suit, uh, which they won, forcing the city to turn this exact information over. Many don't have the time or resources to bring affirmative litigation just to force the city to turn over what is already, what is already its obligations to turn over. Nor should members have to suffer under discriminatory work conditions while the city drags its heels and ignores the law. I'm, I'm being beeped. I hope this legislation will have the teeth necessary to ensure the city turns over the data in a disaggregated way so that it can be properly used by statisticians, providing this information in buckets or averages that can't be used properly to determine if there is paid disparity. Thank you. Respectfully submitted, Vincent Ferriel. Good afternoon, Chair Miller, Chair Eugene, and to all the members of these two great committees. My name is Gloria Middleton, President of Communication Workers of America, Local 1180. I'm here to speak on Intro 633, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York regarding the reporting of pay and employment equity data. I emphasize the word equity, as that is what we are here to talk about this afternoon, equity for all New York City workers, especially for women and minorities. Now, I had a 10-page testimony, but I won't go into all of that. You have a copy of it, and I will go into the important points. Um, as my predecessor said, we engaged into a lawsuit with the city under the Bloomberg administration for uh, administrative managers whose salaries, when we uh, acquired the title, that ranged from $53,000 to $150,000. I heard what DCAS said today. <laughs> um, they refused to negotiate with us as far as uh, changing that minimum salary, and we went to court. The city should lead by example and meet the standards it requires others to follow. It is particularly hip hypocritical that the city requires similar data reporting from contractors doing business with the city and in the city enforces anti-discrimination laws against all employers, yet permits its own city agencies to violate the laws. In some instances, the private sector is doing much better. Corporations who take pay equity and racial discrimination seriously, and not just rhetorically and theoretically, are taking action. There was a report on 60 Minutes last Sunday where a CEO named Mark Benef of Salesforce a corporation with $10 billion in revenue annually had an earnest desire to achieve pay equity in his company. He gathered the data and did an audit of his company to see if there was a persistent pay gap between women and men doing the same job. Guess what? The audit consistently showed through all departments there was a wage and pay gap for women versus men. What we suggest is that we establish a pay and equity commission that shall be under the jurisdiction of the Council's Committee on Governmental Operations. Go ahead, sister. Provide information as set forth in intro 633 to the Council, the public advocate, and the mayor on matters of pay equity. Review and analyze this list in order to eliminate gaps in pay and job equities. Recommend legislative, regulatory, and other changes to agency policies to address issues associated with pay and employment equity. The public advocates report as published in March of this year regarding pay inequities in New York City's mail agencies is further proof that we need a change. Honorable Chairs Miller and Eugene, time's up. Right. We need to make this change now. Thank you for your time. Imagine if we would have heard the 10-page report. <laughs> <laughs> You can proceed. Ch Chair Miller and Eugene and, and council members. My name is Oren Barzillay, president of local 2507 FDNY EMS. Thank you for allowing me to speak today with regards to the need for transparency and access to data necessary to ensure our members are protected from discriminatory pay practices. Our emergency medical service members are predominantly of color and include large percentage of women. 
Our fire inspectors are overwhelmingly of color. They are the ones responsible for inspecting buildings to allow firefighters to do their job. Yet our members earn almost half of what their counterparts on the fire side of FDNY service. We applaud this council's efforts to pass intro 633. This is much needed legislation and will go a long way in ensuring the city comply with its obligation to provide data needed to analyze and end discriminatory pay practices. In particular, I want to emphasize that we need disaggregated data rather than aggregated averages or buckets. Providing simply what some refer to as city level EEO4 would mask the problem it does not offer the data in the form that statistical experts need to run the necessary regression analysis to identify when there is a pay disparity. There is, no harm, there is no harm in releasing the race and gender of our members. The harm comes in continuing to shrewd and keep in the darkness inequity in pay in the city of New York. Passing this law is critically important because while it's Already the city's responsibility to turn this data over, the, sim the city simply will not do so unless and until it's forced to. Currently, right now, as I testified before you, our legal team is in court because despite its obligation to do so, the city will not give us records with regards to the race and gender of our members. I know we are not the first union to have, this, to, have to sue the, to get this information, and I know unions like Local 1180 have been successful. But needing to sue incurs co costs, causes delays, and creates unnecessary adversary between the city and the unions when we should be working together in the shred interest of ending discrimination in the city's workforce. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, I, we just came back from the courthouse that uh, President Barzali uh, mentioned in his uh, testimony. Uh, so I'm glad I made it back in time. I'd just like to read some uh, comments and statement. <clears throat> so good afternoon, Chairman, distinguished members of the City Council. My name is Vincent Barrielli, and I am president of the Local 3621, the Uniformed EMS Officers Union, representing over 500 EMS lieutenants and captains of the New York City Fire Department. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak in support of Intro 633, which would amend the administrative code to ensure disclosure of necessary data to ensure pay equity. I appreciate the actions taken by the City Council advancing legislation to ensure the City provides disaggregated data of race and gender along with pay information to help address the pay inequality in the City workforce. Just to put into perspective how reasonable it is that this information be turned over, I want to explain. When every employee starts working at the City of New York, they fill out a form. One of the pages asks if you would like to voluntarily disclose your race and gender in an EEO section. It also disclosed that while this will be, be kept confidential within the agency, it will be disclosed in accordance with the law, such as requests for this data under FOIL. So this op optional information voluntarily given, which is expressly disclosed to employees, will be turned over to others in accordance with that law. Yet the city claims that giving this information to us so that the statisticians can perform a regression analysis to determine where discrimination is happening among our ranks will be violating those employees' privacy. In fact, today, we, have to, we, we did appear in New York State Court on an Article 78 hearing that would have to bring, a for, bring forward a force the city to turn this data over, despite the fact that other unions have already won decisions in state court, such as Communication Workers of, of America, Local 1180, who just a little over a year ago had to file their own suit, which they won, forcing the city to turn this information over. Many don't have the time or resources to bring affirmative litigation just to force the city to turn over what is already its obligations to turn over. Nor should members have to suffer under discriminatory work conditions while the city drags its heels and ignores the law. I hope this legislation will have the teeth in it necessary to ensure the city turns over this data 
in a disaggregated way so that it can properly use the statisticians providing this information in buckets or in averages that can't be used to properly determine if there's pay disparity. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer it for you. Uh, I'd also like to add, we Thanks. just went to the courthouse across the street, and the excuse that the city is using uh, uh, about not giving us this information happens to do that they don't recognize Veterans Day as a holiday, which is absolutely absurd and disrespectful to all the men and women of the military veterans that we have. They're saying that because of that, that they can't give us the information because of a timely issue. <laughs> I've never heard, this is, at, at best, they can stall further and not give us information, at best, if they were victorious in that, which they were not. But I, I just find it absurd, these, these, these actions they take co continuously just to drag their heels and stall the process out further. Well, thank you. I, I think that there's already obviously been a precedent that's been set and but the city has been known to um, relitigate a case numerous times, hoping one day they'd win. You know, um, we've seen that. But in the interest of time, we're gonna have to call the next committee. But let me just say thank you to each and every one of you for mm -hmm. coming here and, and bringing the truth to power because I've sat here on, on, on that side testifying, obviously representing members. But also, um, isn't it interesting how it's always this glaring um, report on how members are getting served, how services are being delivered timely and efficiently, and then the folks that are responsible for uh, delivering those services come and dispute everything that was just said. Right. And that's what has to happen. So um, my committee and I know my colleagues are available to expand on this very, very important issue. Um, this is fact gathering and we need to pass this legislation and we certainly will and your testimony will assist but that's only one tool in the toolbox and this and, and to, to help us um, attain the equity that we're looking for and we, we will continue to work with each and every one of you beyond this piece of legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, before you go, I, I just want also to thank you and to commend you because uh, during the testimony, you raised very vital and important issues critical to us and that will uh, lead us and help us you know, to take very important decision. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Can, can you hold on one second? Can you hold on? Just for you. Just a quick, simple question. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Is there, what is the city afraid of? Sorry? That's a good question. Uh, I believe the city is afraid of the truth coming out. I mean, th there is no possible victory right now other than stalling and making the actual decision come out at a later date. So basically what they're doing is punishing people and uh, allowing them to continue the discrimination to go on longer, which is a disgrace. So what truth would come out that would be that EMS has 35% women, had over 50% minorities, and is paid $40,000 less a year while doing uh, the same or similar tasks as other uniformed emergency services. The mayor to this date still has not recognized EMS as a uniformed emergency service. They consider us as office personnel and civilians. So the mayor won't even support EMS as far as saying we're an emergency service. Um, and we believe that the data we would obtain would show that in comparison to our diversified emergency service, we have more women minorities compared to other uh, uniformed emergency services, and that's the reason why we're being treated so poorly. We have higher rates of discipline. We are paid $40,000 less a year. We are the workload in the fire department. EMS does 95% of the workload, yet we earn $40,000 less than our counterparts. It sounds like discrimination. It is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We got to get to the next. Thank you, sir. And Beverly Newfield, Angelo Falcone.
Okay, terrific, right. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm here representing 100 organizations. It's a statewide network called Power New York. I want to thank the chairman, the council members, particularly Council Member Cumbo, who has been with us in the equal pay fight from the beginning. So we thank you and we thank each and every one of you for continuing this fight. Um, I'm here for three hours waiting to show solidarity. Uh, advocates across the state, we are a, a network. We meet um, uh, by phone every two weeks, and they care about CWA 1180. We, they will now care about the EMS workers. We're working on uh, education parity as well. Equal Pay Day represents the fact that, that discrimination is happening on so many levels. So I just want to make a, very, a couple points that are in addition to what have been said. What happens in New York City does not stay in New York City. The salary history ban passed, and it has ripple effects across the country. So as hard as it is to do this, that's how important it is that we do it and that we accomplish it. Um, national companies are adopting salary history because of what you passed. Also, of real importance is what's happening in Washington. And what's happening in Washington is that the EEOC rules, all the Obama administration executive orders are being rescinded as we speak. Tomorrow will be another EEOC that will be rescinded. So what you do in terms of progress, it's all about the cities. It's all about the states now. And we have to, if we're gonna do any progress, it's gonna happen right here in this chamber. Um, additionally, um, there's lots of facts, you've covered them all, uh, but I do want to say that you should look at comparable worth. It's pointed out in um, Public Advocate James's report. It is a key to actually creating equity because what we've talked about is the fact that there is a job here and there's a job there. They're in different agencies. We are not comparing them. We need to compare it across agencies, but also women's work is undervalued and underpaid. The only way we'll get at that, why women are always on the bottom of all of these curves, is if you do comparable worth analysis and we look at the value of work. Uh, lastly, um, I just want to say that um, United Kingdom is asking every company of over, I think, 100 um, employees to report their equal pay data. The greatest corporations in the country are doing this because it's good for business. So whatever the way we can push our city to do better on it, um, uh, we're there for you to, um, you know, to, to help. I know you um, didn't like the idea of best practices, but New York City just published this best practices guide. It's through the Commission on Gender Equity. I was part of making that happen. And in it is a mandate, a, a requirement, not a requirement, but a suggestion to all employers to do what you're asking, to look at the data, to really carefully and make a dedicated um, statement about equity from the top and at every level, at every agency. So there is a commitment from the city to do this for other employers, and there needs to be a stronger commitment for us to accomplish it, not just to talk about it on a city, uh, through the city agencies. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm Pre Angelo Falcon. I'm president of the uh, National Institute for Latino Policy. Uh, we've been tracking uh, the underrepresentation of Latinos in the city government since the Ed Koch administration. Uh, I came here, I uh, have now a cane, and I still have my hair, but it's been a long time trying to raise this issue of uh, this persistent problem. Um, our conclusion after looking at uh, these issues over 30 years is that right now the uh, city agencies that you've been uh, hearing from today uh, have basically been failing at least the Latino community and not the entire city in terms of uh, dealing with uh, effective equal employment opportunities uh, for all people. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we would recommend is that uh, when you look at the legislation you're proposing, 
that in fact what you're doing is you may be throwing uh, good money after bad in terms of uh, putting all your eggs in the basket of the existing agencies. Uh, we would re highly recommend that the uh, your committees uh, really look at the issue of looking at the whole e e equal employment opportunity programs uh, at, in a holistic way. Uh, these agencies, I think, right now are uh, basically suffering from what I would call uh, bureaucratic sclerosis in, uh, in terms of their passivity, in terms of the fact that they're not really strong advocates for the issues that uh, I heard uh, you, you're having concerns about. <clears throat> so we would, what we would recommend is that, in fact, you consider a comprehensive overview of all the agencies. Uh, you have two of them here today, but also the Commission on Women, uh, the gender equity is one part of this system, uh, civil the Civil Rights Commission as well, as well as the Civil Service Commission. I think you need to look at them as a whole. <clears throat> we would recommend you consider developing a new agency, a new citywide agency that in fact would embody the kinds of uh, uh, issues that you're talking about dealing with that deal with that will basically look at this from a much more aggressive way than we have now. I submit that the current agencies really are not up to the task. I think they basically, uh, you have within DCAS uh, one agency that is lost in this big bureaucracy which is DCAS and that uh, you really need something that, that's uh, a lot different, that's more comprehensive and that brings all these different agencies that deal with these issues together in a whole different way. Uh, I think if you don't do this, uh, all you're going to be doing is uh, coming back to these same issues every, every year. Uh, right now, the system we have now, uh, on the last page of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the testimony, uh, it, it, we try to map out the different agencies that are involved. So I think you need to take a much wider look at this issue uh, and look at it from a, from a whole different perspective than, uh, than simply uh, adding more function to agencies that have already failed uh, in their mission. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and your years of advocacy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I've, I've actually done some work with each of you, so I yes, appreciate thank it. You so much. Appreciate your service. Thank you. And also on behalf of the committee, thank you so very much for thank your testimonies. You. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shamir Settle. Jonas. Okay, you may begin. Yep. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be invited to testify uh, today in connection uh, to the proposed amendments to the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to, to, to the reporting and analysis of pay and uh, employment equity data. My name is Jonas Scheinder, and I work at the Fiscal Policy Institute. Um, we know that economic inequality driven by race and gender disparities in hiring and compensation have, long, uh, have a long history in the United States and is quite well studied. Despite uh, some progress, however, uh, the deep-seated uh, biases uh, tend to persist. Uh, the, um, if, you, if we look at the disparity and at the income uh, at blacks and, his, and, and Hispanic uh, households will see 38.5 and 46.8 thousand uh, dollars correspondingly while the white households tend to have about 61 on average median income. Similarly, the poverty rates are higher, uh, more than double uh, in white, uh, in, in uh, black and Hispanic, and Hispanic uh, households. Now, women also uh, tend to earn less than men in um, all occupational categories. Some reports project Hispanic women, for instance, to attain pay equity by year 2233, while black women 
will get there by year 21, 24. That may be unacceptable. So what uh, this law, this uh, new, 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 new amendments uh, propose is a good development. It is possible that a lot of these disparities come uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of biases that are unintentional. And this is why it is very important to have a pooled and centralized approach to, to the data analysis. It's important to use uh, coherent uh, statistical techniques in evaluation to see w where the problems may be so that they could be, uh, they could be rooted out. Thank you for your attention, I'm out of time, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's an honor to be here and to speak before you all. Um, my name's Shamir. I'm a policy analyst also at the Fiscal Policy Institute, and I would like to second all of the recommendations that my colleague has made. Um, in my short career as an economist, uh, the gender wage gap has been a very significant component of all of my research. Uh, in Jonas's testimony, the, the Fiscal Policy Institute um, also supports the research done by the Institute for Women's Policy Research, where I was also a researcher and worked to combat the same issues. Um, the data that we would be able to have access to would allow us to do very exciting research that we know would be in support of every testimony that everyone has given today. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to speak in support of this. Okay, thank you. So, um, but first of all, let me just say that I, it, it kind of, I knew that the Institute was going to be here testifying, but, you know, we're, we're kind of used to Dr. Parrott being here for so many years. and. And right. We work together in, in, in so many different capacities, and the work, how valuable the work of uh, the Fiscal Policy Institute, how we value it and how necessary it is. And in, in, in speaking to that, um, you were here for the uh, administration's testimony. Correct. They pretty much said that there was no way for them to provide this data without uh, violating confidentiality. And you're expertise could you would you have any suggestions as to how that could be done yes uh, prior to joining uh, the fiscal policy institute i was a director of data analysis and strategic planning at the department of consumer affairs and uh, i am the data person so this is a very interesting issue for me uh, i do believe that there is a widespread widespread uh, reluctance to uh, to data and to and to research in, uh, in mayoral agencies. Data has to reveal uh, information, it has to tell the story, it's not supposed to make somebody look good. However, uh, however, this is the, uh, the world that we live in and it is important uh, to collect the data. If the data is not, uh, if the data is not uh, telling us anything, uh, all the analysis is, is worthless. So do you think that it's possible for someone to kind of access personal information as was implied this afternoon based on the limited uh, data being provided? Yes, I would like to separate the two issues. Issue number one is analysis. Issue number two is reporting. I also worked at the Department of Finance where we worked with taxpayer data, which is highly confidential. So, in, in the tax po policy analysis, we would use very uh, granular, low-level taxpayer data to produce important reports for other agencies, for, uh, for the journalists, et cetera. And something similar could be done in this case, where the data could be worked on by one set of uh, uh, people and reported to another set of people in a way that actually reveals what is going on. I would like to also um, mention one thing. Uh, from my experience, from my experience, I know that quite a lot of people do serve uh, outside of their 
category. We had quite a few people at Consumer Affairs, for instance, whose titles were community associates. They were analysts. Now, that, I think, is misleading. And if, if, if we start pooling the data, if we start using the data to, uh, to reveal insights, the data itself has to be properly sourced, it has to be properly captured, and the information behind the data points has to be accurate. Wow, that's so interesting. I just met with the union uh, representing those folks last week, and, and that we're talking about a title in which folks who are doing life work and not being compensated appropriately or being compensated differently based on uh, demographics that we, we've been talking about here today. And um, it, I, I want to thank you because it's so important. Yes, and we'd love to follow up with you uh, on the information that is being provided. And just to show that what happens when you kind of stay to the very end, it's as good as it gets from the beginning to the end. It's just really important information. It's not just this because there's certainly work to do beyond passing this legislation and achieving our goals. So I want to thank you so very much. Thank you very much. I am very uh, committed uh, to this issue. You can uh, you could rely on me as a as a useful professional and resource for your analysis and evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, much. also to thank both you so of you. Thank you. Okay. With that, adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much to all of you for your testimony. Uh, the meeting is adjourned.